Chris Lander is the definition of average. An average student going to an average school and living an average life until one day a truck coon kisses him a little too hard and he is thrown through the void. When he wakes up, he finds out that he is in the body of Son Goku. With his new life, he will be anything but average and rise to the top until he becomes a god. What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn As Goku? Ascending to Godhood. Part 1. Disclaimer, this is a harem fanfic. MCX Chichi X Bulma. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Birds chirping in the beautiful spring breeze were overshadowing a very important confession that took every speck of courage an average young man would have. And wouldn't you know it, this person was the very definition of average from top to bottom. When he stands, his height is a whopping 176 centimeters with a cool 70 kilograms to boot. Slightly tan with warm brown eyes and jet black hair, coupled with a very plain looking face, his features would make you miss him in a crowd of people. Chris Lander wouldn't have minded that he was average in the spectrum. Don't get him wrong, he would have loved to be handsome and popular with the ladies. But it sure beats being unattractive or too large, that people would only notice your personality. So, these past few months we have really been getting to know each other. I was wondering if you would like to grab a bite to eat sometime this week. Chris said with trepidation. He was asking his crush since entering high school. Well, she was kind of everyone's crush. Hum, are you asking me out on a date? Said Fane while she looked like she was thinking. Chris was internally very nervous, but calmly nodded his head. Fane was a breath of fresh air in this average school where everything is boring. She had gorgeous golden locks with dark eyes that you look at forever. Her body was a man's dream and nightmare that you can look and not help but get sucked into. Even her name was unique, making her stand out even more. With her above average grades, she was any man's dream. So, of course, he will get rejected. Sorry, I can't. Evan invited me over to his house to work on a project. So I don't know if I am able to. Fane remarked, acting a little bit regretful to not hurt Chris too much. Even though Chris was not a love interest of Fane, coupled with the fact that she only knew him for a few months, she couldn't bear to hurt his feeling. Because Chris was a chill guy and great friend, he didn't seem to ask anything of her and listen attentively to anything she ranted on about. She didn't want to lose such a great friend that she felt like she knew forever. Of course, it is Evan, thought Chris as he was slowly resigning into his fate. Evan was the male counterpart of Fane excluding everything that made Fane likable. His horrible personality consists of inflating his own ego and eating up any praises sent his way from his countless admirers. Everyone at school painted them as the perfect couple. Chris had experienced Evan's personality firsthand when he joined Fane's friend group in order to get closer to her. Everyone despised him for doing so, especially Evan. Unknown to both, someone was leaning in through the doorway to eavesdrop of their private conversation. The figure let out a small snicker and said quietly, Here, yeah, learn your place. I, I see. But I didn't say when. Chris said, blatantly ignoring the hint that Fane threw at him to try his luck once more. Fane's eye twitched a little, take a hint, would you? She gave him a blunt reply with a wry smile. Chris huffed to mask how much it hurts to get turned down. Yeah, I get it. Fane looked at him confused, you aren't hurt. I turned you down pretty harshly there. It was Chris's turn to wryly smile at her. If you expect rejection, you don't get hurt as much. You still have to ask to test your luck, and the reward is much sweeter this way. Fane looked at Chris with the brightest smile Chris had seen her with, making his heart skip a beat. So, we still friends. Fane looked at Chris expectantly. Chris could only numbly nod his head. Great. He, let's go, we will be late for the next class. As Fane skipped across the room and out into the hallway, Chris could hear her talking to someone animatedly as he let out a hefty sigh. Time to let these feelings go. Hair, time will help let these feelings go. Chris was walking down the empty street with a couple of grocery bags on hand. It was late at night, with the stars shining brightly and the moon full in all its glory. Ah, 
I knew that Fane would reject me, everything about me is average. Why would she accept me? At least we will still be friends until I can get rid of these feelings the 17-year-old lamented in his heart. Right now, Chris is walking to the house from getting a few things from the local grocery store in his neighborhood. In all actuality, he didn't need to go out and get the few groceries that he did. He wanted to because his parents are home at this time. In the Lander household, crash. Another crash sounded as a pan fell from its resting spot on the stove. Luckily it was empty as no one really cooks in the house anyways. Crash another bang sounded across the house as Mama Lander had her back pressed against the counter with Papa Lander, making her unable to speak as his mouth was connected with hers. Oh, honey. Mama Lander grunted and they did the deed. This was quite a normal occurrence in the Lander house, as Chris found at the ripe age of eight. Back with Chris, his parents were spies in some secret organization that he had no clue of. He only found out when they were too busy humping each other, that they let a 10-year-old go into their office and look through some files. He only got the gist of it until they drove him out of there to continue the deed in the office. Ever since that day, they did not allow him to go inside their office again. Because of the nature of their job, Chris's parents are usually out for months at a time, and when they do go home, they go at it like rabbits, not caring about privacy or anything of the like. Because of this, Chris's bond with his parents isn't very strong. He does have unconditional love for them, but that really is as far as it gets. Being the nymphos that they are, Chris's parents taught Chris all about the wonderful nature of sex and babies, when Chris first found them going at it. The reason they did this, or at least the reason they told themselves, was that because Chris was going to learn about it sooner or later, and he could use that information to become more mature later on. The real and obvious reason was so that they can do it more often without shame. Today, incidentally, was one of those days. So Chris decided to get groceries and wander a little bit, until he felt like they were finished. Just because he was interested in sex, it doesn't mean that he wants to see his parents doing it over and over and over again until they pass out while still inside of each other. They should be done by now. Chris thought as he was walking down the street. He reaches a crosswalk and is only a couple of blocks away from his house. He looks right. Nothing. Left. Nothing. Right again. Nothing. He proceeds to walk to the other side of the street. Another uneventful day. Once again what is this feeling? Chris sensed an incredible foreboding on his right side. As he turns to look, a literal truck just appears out of thin air. A regular pickup truck at first glance. But if you look closely, you can see that the truck is eluding a greenish aura that is seemingly distorting the air around it. What the fuck? Chris reacts quickly and hurriedly reaches the other side of the road. Upon reaching the sidewalk he releases the tension that he built up when he first became uneasy. What was with that truck? As he looks back at the truck, the truck swerves heading directly towards Chris. Shit. Even in the face of death, he had a look of calm. Maybe that was the only thing that was not average of Chris Lander. The fact that he can look and act calmly while his insides raged with emotion. Crime scene, yellow police tape was everywhere around a suburban sidewalk. However, the peculiar thing was that inside of the tape was absolutely nothing. Like the crime evidence and scene just vanished overnight. A couple of police officers were talking and taking note of the crime scene. This is very strange. There is no indication that anything hit him. Like he just fell backward and died. Said the first police officer in confusion. That is impossible. We can see skit marks over there was presumably a truck went off the road and slammed into him. How are we doing with CCTV? Said the obvious police captain who was investigating the scene. Jeffrey came back earlier with it. He said that all the cameras in this street in particular shut down at the same time. When they turned back on, the victim was already dead. Replied the first police officer again. What the hell? Reports back at the morgue state that he was in perfect health. No signs of heart failure or any diseases. Cried the police captain as he pulled his hair in frustration. Whoever did this is obviously very experienced or planned this out extensively. I don't know how they did it. But we will find the culprit if it's the last thing we do. The police captain and his subordinate will walk the ends of the earth to find the trails of the legendary truck gun. You know when you watch a nime or read novels about a character getting kicked in the ass by truck gun, it always seemed kind of painless. That they just happily get reincarnated without another thought that they just died. Well, that was how it's supposed to be not this unrelenting pain. It feels like I am boiling in my own skin like some sort of tender meat in an oven. The darkness is maddening because there is nothing there except the pain to accompany Chris in his thoughts. 
Chris could feel all his nerves and how they were screaming for the torture to stop. Why am I feeling so much pain if I am dead? Is there an afterlife or something similar? Is this eternal darkness and pain hell? I, uh, Chris tries to scream to vent the frustration he is feeling. But the only noise that comes out is a muffled screech. That makes him feel and sound like he is underwater. Someone is talking in the background. But Chris is too preoccupied with his screaming and pain to fully make out the words. Slowly his consciousness fades away. Chris wakes up with a start as his eyes protest intensely because of the sudden intake of light and movement. He can barely see anything as everything is a blur due to the fact that his eyes have not adjusted. He blinks his eyes rapidly to restore them. As his eyesight finally recovers, he notices that he is in some sort of hut. The hut was very small with a bed tucked in the corner, a brown table in the center, a black wardrobe, and cleaning supplies next to the window. What really caught Chris's attention was what was on the wardrobe. Robe. Laying there was a mesmerizing orange ball with four orange stars embedded inside. The ball was on top of an orange cushion. That made it seem more fragile than it actually was. One could see the smooth outside of the ball shine brightly like glass as it reflected the sun, making it seem more majestic. What the hell a Dragon Ball? Wait what am I thinking? There is no way that is a Dragon Ball. Dragon Balls aren't real. It really got me there for a second. That is one top grade replica. Unbeknownst to anyone, Chris in his previous life was really into novels, video games, manga, and a nine. Although he knew about Dragon Ball from its early days, he only started to take interest later in his early teens. Once he got into it though, he couldn't stop. Reading all the manga, watching all the Animan movies, downloading all the games. One could say he really enjoyed Dragon Ball. As Chris was inspecting the Dragon Ball, he heard a voice from behind him. Looks like you are awake. You took quite the fall there, young un. Turning around, he noticed an old short man with a frizzly mustache, orange vest, and a green hat with a white ball at the top. His face had a look of concern and exasperation when looking at Chris. What a statue old man. Wait, why does he look familiar? Chris felt like he met this old man before, but that is impossible. Such a strong statue would have been engraved into his mind from the get-go. Under the gaze of the old man, Chris finally felt like he would get some answers about this place and the fact that he isn't roadkill on the sidewalk. Who are you and where am I? How did I get here? Asked Chris. He couldn't put his finger on it. But all his senses were telling him that this old man is very dangerous. So he asked some conservative questions first. Hey. The old man had a look of shock coloring his face. You are actually talking to me. You usually make a fuss and violently thrash around. Looks like that blow to your head made you lose your memories and made you more tolerable. Can't say if this is a blessing in disguise. It was Chris's turn to look shocked. Blow to the head. All he could remember was Truck Sama kissing him way too hard. Wait, did I actually get Isekade into another world? Then that Dragon Ball something clicked inside Chris's head as he regained his senses. He decided to ask one of the most important questions that are plaguing his mind. WH what is my name? Chris asked as he faintly felt something behind him near his butt. It felt like a third arm or something. Why of course you are Son Goku. You are the grandson of Son Gohan which is me of course. That fall really did a number on your mind. Sit on the bed so that I could inspect your head. Goku is me. Chris could only numbly go through the motions as Grandpa Gohan slowly unwrapped the bandages off of Goku's head. Grandpa Gohan seems confused at Chris's strange way of confirming his name, but does not put much other thought into it. What a weird kid. Wait am I still Chris or am I Goku? Ah, it hurts to think about. But since I am inhabiting Goku's body, I will have to say that I am Goku, as Master Roshi already knows. That Gohan took me in. It feels weird letting go of my old name along with my old life. I'll think about that another time. On another note how did I get here? The easy reason is that Truck Sama has extraterrestrial powers, and let me have a chance at an extraordinary life. But that reasoning isn't so easy to accept. Why me? What is my purpose here? Chris lets out a sigh as Grandpa Gohan inspects the scar on Goku's head. From our conversation, I can only deduce that this is after Goku fell into the ravine and hit his head. Somehow I transferred into his body at that time. Maybe that is the reason that my body felt like it was on fire when I first came here. I was probably struggling for control when this body was at a near-death encounter. This is perfect. This way I won't have to explain why my personality changed so much. Because Goku's personality changed just as much in canon. Goku was extremely happy, and before he knew it, his tail was rocking back and forth like a puppy. 
Goku gasped as he realized what happened. He blushed due to his shame and lack of self-control, as he used muscles that he never used before to bring his tail in front of him. Although he never had a tail before, obviously, it felt so natural to just swish his tail back and forth, like it was an extra leg or arm. As he was inspecting his tail, Grandpa Gohan finished his inspection. Well, there is going to be a permanent scar. But it isn't too big or noticeable, you should be fine. Goku nodded, flashing a bright smile at Grandpa Gohan. Grandpa Gohan felt like he was melting at the purity of Goku's smile, and couldn't help but smile back. Seems like his fall changed him for the better. I am glad. I thought all kids were devils like him. As Grandpa Gohan was having less than nice thoughts about children, Chris's determination took a new turn. I was average in my previous life, but Goku is anything but average. With this body, I will uphold Goku's legacy and beyond. I will use this chance to rise to the top and become the greatest fighter all of the multiverses has ever known. Three years later, age 744, today I am seven years old. Goku thought as he was meditating. He was trying to fully control the Kai that is swelling inside of him. Goku has spent these three years really thinking about his plan to rise, while also training his martial arts and Kai control. I don't even know what situation I am in, whether this is the manga or an I'm. I don't even know if movie villains are somehow going to be popping up out of nowhere, or if only some of them will come at all. Even GT is an unknown variable, because technically that isn't canon. And even the Super Manga and Anime are somewhat different. Apostrophe with all these unknowns, it is nearly impossible to map out a plan. Because of this, all I can do is just grow as strong as I can, while riding the flow of events. Trying to stick as close to canon is a good option, so that I can have control of the situation, and know what is coming next. Going off the rails just to be more powerful is an unnecessary risk as I already know I have the potential to be the best. One of the things that had Goku thinking of was the existence and usage of Kai. Having Kai circulating through his body was so invigorating. There was nothing like it on Earth, and it had so many uses such as energy blast, flight, and even elemental manipulation. Energy coursed in his veins as he tried his hardest to control it. Unlike his tail, this control took a little more practice, but still easy nonetheless. Probably due to his say in biology that let him wield Kai better than humans. As Goku finished his Kai control exercises that he created, he quickly got up and headed towards his grandpa to beg him to teach him martial arts once again. Of course, using the good Olay fashion puppy dog look, or in Goku's case, puppy monkey looks equipped with the tail and all. Grandpa reluctantly agrees again, and started showing Goku some basic cartas from the turtle school. Later that night, Goku woke up with an incredible burning sensation in his groin area. Oh, man I got a pee and I can't hold it in. It feels like it's going to burst. Goku thinks as he runs out of the hut making sure not to wake Grandpa Gohan. I don't think tonight is a full moon. I won't look anyway and just relieve my business as fast as I can. Goku in all of the three years that he was been here made extra sure to keep track of the moon cycles. Even if there was not a full moon as a precaution, he still did not look as he feared any small mistake will lead to Grandpa Gohan's death. Goku finishes up his business, but as he pivots on the heel of his shoe to turn around and go back to sleep, as he does so he accidentally slips and lands on his back. Oh man, now my back and tail are covered in piss. I'll wash up before I go back to bed. As he opens his eyes, he notices a silver orb floating in the sky. It seemed to be mocking him as Goku is in a stunned realization of what that orb truly was. He quickly closes his eyes as he realizes what happened, but it was too late. He starts to grow as hair erupts from everywhere in his body. Monkey-like features appears on his body, along with a panic expression at what was happening. No, 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 no. This can't be happening. I tried so hard so this won't happen. Goku screamed as he grew two over five meters in a span of a few seconds. As Goku's conscious slips away, all he can hope for is that Grandpa Gohan is safe. Goku wakes up to a breeze as his head feels groggy. He looks around trying to remember what had happened until he sees the destruction that littered the ground. Trees were uprooted while others were forcibly snapped through the middle. A cone-shaped field of destruction that had no life whatso all in its wake was right in front of him. Goku remembers what happened and becomes a little relieved to see that he isn't close to his house. Maybe I went in the opposite direction of the house, and Grandpa is safe. He felt a little hope spark in his chest, until he sees a pile of clothes in all the debris. An orange shirt with circles and a green hat with a ball of pure white on top. 
Goku's stomach felt like a pit as he slowly crawled his way to the clothes. Although he hasn't been in this world for long, Grandpa Gohan's affection seeped into his heart. His first experience with real familial love was intoxicating. He felt nothing in his other world could compare when his grandpa would shower him with love and they would do activities together. He couldn't speak, words were stuck in his throat and because of it, he felt like he was choking. He couldn't breathe while tears were threatening to come out of his. He forced them to stay still as tried to regain the calm demeanor that he always wore. He wouldn't let himself cry, but the pain was unbearable, even more so than when Fane rejected him. He forced himself to take a breath by deeply intaking air. But such an action stabbed him in the back. He couldn't hold his tears in any longer as they spilled out of his eyes and onto the clothes that he was holding. He started crying for one of the only times in his life as he struggled to keep himself together. On that day he screamed to the heavens blaming himself for this grandfather's demise. On that day his resolve grew stronger as life marched on. Bonus scene. At a house on an island in the middle of the ocean, Kane Senen. Kane Senen. Screamed a voice originating from the ocean. A figure rose from the shore and slowly went over to the pink house that was perched on the sand. He opened the door with a slam. Kane Senen. Inside the house was an old man laughing creepily in front of a TV set. On TV were rows of women doing stretches, instructing the presumably female audience on what to do. Hey hey little girly I hear you. Now why don't you stretch a little more? In fact, the old man held no shame as he went up to the TV. Screen with blood spewing out of his nose. Kane Senen. What are you doing? Screamed the figure that walked into the house to such a perverted showing. The old man jumped in fright hurriedly turning off the TV with such speed to make one question his moniker's appropriateness. A turtle, I was just trying some videos that would teach me how to stretch. You know me, these old bones need a good tuning. The figure was revealed to be an actual turtle that was actually quite large compared to its brethren. Turtle sweat dropped at the poor display to cover his deeds and just shook its head to try to reason that the great Senen wouldn't do such a thing. Anyway, you got a letter from Sun Gohan. It came in just today. Ah, Gohan A. Eh? That rascal I wonder how he is doing. At least he sends me mail. That Ox King has the gall to not communicate with me with all I have done for him. Kane Senen snatched the letter from the turtle at superhuman speeds. But the turtle didn't even flinch expecting such movement. Let's see what he wrote. A boy with a monkey tail. Well, that is something you don't see every day. He made him his grandson. Son Goku, eh? He had a violent disposition before he fell down a ravine and hit his head. How did he fall down a ravine in the first place? What is Gohan doing with that boy? Next thing you know he will throw him in the ocean or tie him to balloons and let him fly in the sky and call that training. After he hit his head he became nicer and smarter with interest towards martial arts. He wants me to train him in a few years when he is ready. Ha ha ha, that Gohan throwing me his problems. Son Goku. It seems like he is an interesting young man. West City, where are you going, Sweetums? The one who was talking was a blonde with incredibly curly hair in the front and attiring a long dress while watering her plants. Her house was in the shape of a dome with smaller domes on the outside, with paths leading to them. Adorned with a multitude of rectangular and square windows and cylinder-shaped rooms, jutted out at the top, that makes them look similar to chimneys. In the front of the building in large letters read out, Capsule Corporation. Inside the building leads to a huge indoor garden with an array of animals playing with each other. This is where the blonde was watering her plants. I told you, Mom, I am going to go find the Dragon Balls, yelled an exasperated blue-haired teenager. This new person, presumably the daughter of the blonde although the only characteristics they share is their raw beauty, was wearing a bright red ribbon that tied her hair into a ponytail and a pink dress with a brown pouch strapped to it. With her very blue eyes, creamy like skin to complement her beauty, money for days, and one of the smartest minds on the planet, she was a crush crusher. I am going to wish for myself the perfect boyfriend, said the blue-haired teen. As she said so, she held her hands to her face, and if you look close enough, you can even see hearts popping in and out of existence around her. Truly a natural phenomenon. Oh dear, those shiny orange balls with the stars that you found a while back. I'm worried about the dangers out there. Despite her saying so, she did not look that worried at all. In fact, she just went back to watering her plants, seemingly not caring for a reply. It is alright Panchi, as Long Bomber doesn't go near the forest next to Mount Peozu. She can take care of herself, said a man whose face was covered with paper. The person this time was a short middle-aged man equipped with glasses and a newspaper. 
A black cat was perched on his shoulder next to his light gray hair. The entire time he was talking, his eyes never left the newspaper. Whatever, I am leaving now to get my perfect boyfriend, exclaims Bulma as she rushes towards the door with way too much enthusiasm to get out of the house. I don't think she heard you. Dear, what's wrong with the forest near Mount Peozu? Asks Panchi with a more concerned expression. Well, according to this newspaper, there has been a sighting of a giant creature that wreaks destruction wherever it goes. Craters devoid of life, trees snapped in half or uprooted. This all has been happening for the past couple of years or so on every full moon. Unknown to them, Bulma and her turbo car is speeding east towards Mount Peozu in search of her first Dragon Ball in her adventure for a perfect boyfriend. Mount Peozu. Sitting near a river, one can see a relatively large boulder moving up and down. Under it is a small child with spiky hair and a furry tail. Actually, the tail of said boy also had a rock that is used for training, as it was swaying up and down. The boy was Goku as there were no other monkey-tailed children in this universe. The movement of the boulder contributes to the push-ups that he was doing next to the river. Letting the boulder and rock go, he lays down to rest as he prepares to hunt in search of lunch, while also working out his legs. Ah, these few years have been pretty uneventful. But I guess I should have expected that. The only things I have been doing to pass the time were just kite training, training in general, and trying to master that blasted Great 8 transformation. For this past couple of years, Goku has been looking at the full moon every time to try and finally master the Great 8 form to no avail. The only thing he created was stories parents would tell kids when they misbehave. The Great Simeon will come and get you if you don't finish your homework. Trying to control the form is next to impossible. All I see is red while rage and destruction plague my thoughts uncontrollably. If Super Saiyan 4 does exist, then learning the Azaru form now will be a huge boon. Even if GT isn't canon in my world, learning it still has a good power increase, and it will be interesting to see how it interacts with Super Saiyan and God. Goku sighs as he stands up to catch some fish. Walking over to the river, he sticks out his tail while dipping it in the water. At least I know that today is the day Bulma comes to my house. Good thing I borrowed that calendar from the city a while back to know when she will come. Otherwise, I would die from just repeatedly training and no human contact. Goku feels a presence about to emerge from the river. Jumping quickly, Goku whips his tail back while turning around to face his prey. With one swift kick to the chest, the fish dies instantly while landing perfectly into Goku's hands. I now know why Goku eats so damn much. With the combination of martial arts and Saiyan metabolism and seemingly endless stomach, I have to eat so much just to survive. Saiyans are a warrior race after all. Goku races on the dirt road leading to his house, while having ginormous fish above his head. As he was almost arriving at his doorstep, he hears a low humming sound coming from behind him. The humming sound slowly becomes louder as a car comes into view along the road. Inside is a cheery blue head hormonal teenager that is not paying attention to the road. Seriously, how did she get her driver's license? How does she not see me when I am holding a giant fish? Bomba sees Goku just as she is about to crash into him. She tries to skid out of the way but fails miserably because she is too close. Goku kicks her car out of the way after setting his fish down, making Bulma do two tumbles before stopping. As Goku approaches the car to make sure Bulma is okay, a pistol suddenly appears and fires straight at Goku's head. Although he knows he will be fine, he dodges anyway because it sure dang will hurt. Bulma fires a couple of more shots from the safety of her car, without seeing if they hit or not. After a while, she peeks from her turned over the car to see if whatever attacked her is dead. Her car is reeked as a lone tire rolls on by like a tumbleweed. Where is it? Bulma asks after she finds nothing but a small hut in the vicinity. Are you done shooting? Says a voice from behind a boulder to her left. As the voice subsides, Goku comes from behind the boulder to check the situation. This makes the gun that has smoke coming from its barrel immediately aim at Goku's head once more. Who are you? How were you able to throw my car to the side like that? Bulma seemed quite terrified at the prospect of this small child being able to ram one ton of steel like it was nothing. My name is Son Goku. I live out here in my house right over there. Goku proceeds to point to his hut just a few feet away. You were about to run me over so naturally. I kicked it out of the way. I could have dodged, but you might have crashed into my house. Bomba reddens in shame when Goku inexplicably tells her that she lost control and wasn't paying attention. She masks it with anger instead as she yells, You still haven't told me how you did that. Having that kind of strength isn't normal. 
let alone a kid having it. Huh. I am 12, almost a teenager. I have been training martial arts as a kid with my grandpa. Kicking a car away is nothing. Now, can you put down your gun and tell me why you are at my house? Bomber reluctantly puts down her gun as she gets out of the turned over vehicle dusting herself. She still looks a little wearily at Goku, but answers him nonetheless. My name is Bomber. Bomber briefs. I am tracking some things called Dragon Balls. And I was told that one is in that house of yours. She points to his hut. Goku motions for Bomber to go in, and they both enter Goku's hut. As Bomber looks around, Goku couldn't help but look at Bomber in more detail. Although her face has some childlike features, she is still one of the most beautiful girls that he has ever seen. Internally, Goku is gushing to meet one of the most memorable and influential characters in Dragon Ball, with her Dragon Raider, Spaceship, Tanamic, Time Travel Technology, and Gravity Chamber to name a few. She undoubtedly surpasses Yamcha, Chen, and Chiaotzu in importance. A slash N. Krillin dying in DB and DBZ did spur Goku on a lot, so that counts, right? I wonder if he had died in Super, Goku would have reached UI and Master it sooner. Who knows Colin P, when Bomber sees the Dragon Ball resting comfortably on the cushion, she rushes forward grabbing it to inspect it. Goku, exasperated, keeps with the act of ignorance, by snatching away the ball. Hey, that's my memento of my late grandfather. Is this a Dragon Ball? Goku questions innocently. Bulma nods her head a little too fast. Yup, that's it, look. Bulma opens her pouch revealing two more similar balls, one with two stars, and another with five stars, and puts them on the table. These are Dragon Balls. There are seven in total, and from what I learned is that if you manage to find them all, a magical dragon comes to life and grants you any wish you desire. Feigning shock, Goku exclaims, any wish. Wow, that is crazy. What are you going to use the wish for? Anyone with two brain cells would have noticed Goku's terrible acting. But once Bomba was asked what she was going to wish for, nearly all of them died on the spot. I am going to use the wish to get the perfect boyfriend. For some reason, the area around Bomba started to sparkle as she looks at the ceiling daydreaming. Goku was enchanted by her beauty on the spot despite not having reached puberty yet. That was until she started drooling all over the Dragon Balls on the table. Goku's trance is broken right away, and finally lets resentment towards this stupid wish out, for the perfect boyfriend. I don't know about this dragon, but I don't think you thought your wish out that well. Bomber tilts her head in confusion. I mean, would the guy just pop out of nowhere with no life beforehand? You never know this dragon could be kind of like a genie where they con you just for the fun of it. It would be kinda weird if you date a guy that was just born. Even if the dragon makes a random perfect guy show up or find you, how would you know that he would like you? If he is perfect then he will probably not care about money or beauty. But how would you know he will like your personality? He might break up with you right away. Huh. I never thought about it like that. Bomber started thinking about reorganizing her wish. Why don't you just look for one the normal way? This time, Bomber started to get red from frustration. You don't know how hard it is to get even a decent guy. All they want me for is my money or my body or both. My face and name are so well known because of our corporation that I don't know who is genuine with their emotions. Stunned at her outburst, Goku could only stare deep into her fiery blue eyes. Anyways, hand me the Dragon Ball now, Bomber says reaching forward. What? No. This the last thing I have to remember my grandpa. I want something in return, said Goku hoping to extract some benefits as well. Well, what do you want? Oh, I know what you want, Bomber says while smiling goofily. You want a... Although Goku would love to see and touch her panties, he stops her before she can ask. You are from the city, right? I lived out here in the words all my life. Can you show me around and lend me some help? Bomber was happy that he didn't want anything perverted, but also feeling a little insecure that he didn't want anything to do with her body. Bomber thought about the proposal for a little bit. Sure, you sound like a decent kid. Why don't you come with me? You seem pretty strong so you can be like my little bodyguard. That way I don't have to drive all the way back here after I am done and we can go on a little adventure. Afterward, I can show you around the city. I can even offer you a job if you want because you seem somewhat smart for your age. Job? Asked Goku genuinely confused. Why would I need a job? Yeah well, our last head of security died when this new and upcoming army called the Red Ribbon Army started to peek its head out of the underworld. You seem strong and talented enough. I will pay and give you some resources so you can train. You said you are a martial artist right? I I am. I will, uh, think about it. 
Goku started to rack his brain on the benefits of actually having a job in normal life. Goku didn't really have a job, and really relied on Kai Kai while he slacked off and trained. I guess having his kind of job won't really affect anything that much, while making sure I have a steady income in the future. Heh <laughs> heh. I will use this kid's strength on my quest for the Dragon Balls, then lure him to get a job from me. Even I understand that I am all protected by technology, and that raw muscle is sometimes needed. I will make him feel comfortable around me and take the job. Daddy told me to do recruitment so here I am, thought Bulma while having an evil smile on her face. A chill ran through Goku's spine when he saw that look in her face. Hey anyways, I don't mind going with you. I wanted to leave this place for a while anyway. Just let me pack a few things. Once Goku was ready, Bulma used a capsule to materialize a motorcycle out of nowhere. Goku had sparkles in his eyes at the display of incredible spatial technology, while Bulma had a smug grin on her. They quickly got on and sped through the dirt road to a new and exciting adventure. Universe 6, in the middle of space, A-H-H-H-H-H, just as his name implies, he is a thorn to my side. Screeched a fat, purple, furry cat to no one in particular. He wore a set of red Egyptian-style attire, adorned with golden bands across his arms. That made his yellow eyes stand out more. He was heaving as he bends down, hands on knees, to catch his breath. Oong, I am so tired. I want a nap already. You can barely hear him in between his gasps for air. Well, if you ate the diet I made for you and exercise, we maybe could have already caught him, Lord Champa. The female voice to his side berates him for his figure. The woman was blue in complexion with long white hair tied into a ponytail. She wore a green dress with similar patterns as her partner with a white halo around her neck. Holding the strange staff in her hands, she replayed the battle that took place minutes ago and told him what went wrong. Her angelic voice, purple lipstick, intense eyes, and perfect facial feature made her a living angel. If she wasn't already, Thorn has wreaked too much havoc in this universe, messing with time and evening breaching to other universes. If I don't stop him until this gets any worse, Grand Zeno might just erase me before erasing all of Universe 6, just to get rid of him. Champa had a dark look in his eyes as purplish energy surrounded him destroying everything that nears. Yes, quite the conundrum. I suggest you move quickly to avoid that, said his attendant not looking too worried. She wasn't the one getting erased after all. Ch-M-P-H, enough idle chatter. Vados, let's go to Fewer to see if he has any more leads. If not, we will go to the Chronoa at the Time Nest. Hopefully, they have some good food at that place. The two cosmic beings quickly vanish in a ray of light vanishing from their spot just moments ago. Traveling at high speeds through the dirt road, one can see a motorcycle with a certain blue-haired girl with a spiky hair midget strapped onto her back. Wrapping his arms around her waist, the breeze felt great as this was Goku's first time in a long time riding in a vehicle. The wind was intoxicating. Hey, you haven't told me how we are going to even find these Dragon Balls. Goku asked while sticking his head out to enjoy the breeze. Phew phew phew. Naturally, I am a genius even with mystical items. Take a look, I created it myself. Bulma said while handing Goku the fabled Dragon Radar. The little dots are the Dragon Balls. So we know where to go. I am so amazing aren't I? Looking at one of the most powerful tools ever. It looked so simple and fragile. However, needless complexity only made things worse. Sometimes so Goku can appreciate simplicity. Wow, you really are smart to be able to create something like this. I've never seen anything like it. Goku half lied. Truth be told, GPS was more complex because it mapped out landmasses with detail. But it couldn't track magical wish granting balls of power. Bulma blushed at the comment before they started to fly in the sky after going off of a small hill. H H H H H. They both screamed in unison. Later, oh my gosh. How did you survive these roads without me before? Goku asked Bulma as they were both panting on the ground. Due to all the adrenaline rush they were given during the first day of their journey. Well, excuse me. I had a perfect safer vehicle just this morning before someone had to wreck it. Bulma said indigently. Ha, huh, like that is an excuse. You crash into me with that vehicle too. Admit it, you just suck at driving. Goku said smugly. Before he can go on though, his stomach was screaming for attention. Let's rest out here for tonight. The sky was dark as they parked near the road to get off of the motorcycle. Bulma took out her capsule case and started to look for the one that contained a house so they can sleep in it. Man, can you contain anything inside of those things? Goku was quite fascinated with Dragon Ball's technology. Despite the planet and its people looking wild and unruly, 
The technology was one of the most advanced in the universe. Goku was trying to look inside of the case to see the different capsules, but due to the height difference, he had to keep jumping just to catch a glimpse of what's inside. Bulma giggled a little at Goku's antics before she gave him the case, while chucking the one in her hand at the clearing. Almost anything. Technology is always improving. We are working hard to upgrade our capsules and push their limits. So far, living beings and other capsules are some of the only problems we have with capsules. However, we probably won't fix them because capsuling people is unethical, and capsuling capsules is almost worthless. Bulma was explaining capsule technology while they started to walk inside of the newly formed house. The house itself was nothing special as it had the making of a studio apartment with the lack of doors leading to different areas. You make these capsules. Do you make any other technology? Goku said trying to extract more information out of her. This was Goku's world now, not Dragon Ball. He needed to know a lot more than what the creators showed to survive. My dad made the capsules, it is kind of our main project. I help him from time to time to work on other stuff as well. Bomba puffed her chest in pride, making her breast jiggle a little. Goku couldn't help but appreciate the jiggle. He looked away before she could notice. You smell like fish. You need a shower. I will let you take one before me now go before my nose dies. Bomber wrinkled her nose in disgust. Because of the wind, she didn't notice his stench. Now that they are in an enclosed space, it was unbearable. A shower. I haven't been in one of those in a long time. Goku said as he thought of the nice long showers back at his old earth. He missed the technology of those days compared to his hermit lifestyle that he inherited. You have been in one. I thought you lived in the mountains for your whole life. Bomber's curiosity was piqued. Realizing his mistake, he quickly thought of a lie. I, I did. Just once when my grandfather brought me to a village. It was quite memorable. Bulma led Goku to the bath so he could get cleaned up. Goku had the time of his life, finally feeling clean for once in his life. After Bulma finished with her bath, she saw Goku sitting on the table. Hey, I want to talk to you about something. Seeing Bulma confused a little, Goku continued. I just wanted to ask you about your wish. I just really want to know why you would want a perfect boyfriend. Surely not all boys are that bad for you to just wish for one. All of Dragon Ball. Bulma was basically eye candy for all of it either due to Oolong's transformations or Bulma herself. She acted like quite the pervert too. Goku didn't know if it was the teenage impulses or desperation. But once she saw a decently hot guy, she would be all over him. Like with Oolong, Yancha, or Captain Blue. Hopefully, I can change her for the better. I, I get what you're saying. She realized that she is in for a really serious conversation. P people say that my body is one of my only redeeming features besides my scientific smarts. They say that I should not talk too much since my personality is awful. And I am quite mean to people sometimes. So because of that... I have always used my body to get things that I want from guys. I don't have that many true friends. Bomber looked away from Goku to avoid seeing his reaction. She blushed that she was opening up to a kid that she just met today. But she kept on going nonetheless. That's one of the main reasons why I leave school so early. Of course, knowing everything is one thing. But I hate the slimy guys that only talk to me to get into my panties while the girls befriend me for the money. I don't think you are that awful, especially if you have friends that agree with me. Sure, besides your shameless act of wanting a boyfriend, I can see the reasoning behind it is purer than one would expect. With fact that you can basically rule the world with these things, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. Everyone's personality has a few clinks, but that's what makes people special. You should think more before you do something. My grandpa told me that a girl's body is as important as her feelings. That she should only do something with her body if her mind wants her to. What Goku said technically wasn't a lie as his actual grandfather told him that on his old earth. Goku flashed her a smile. With his pep talk, hopefully, she acts with a little more conservative than she used to or will. Despite her misgivings, Bomber is a good person at heart. She isn't some manga character pleasing the readers anymore. To me, she is a real person and can change for the better. After Goku was done, Bulma really started pondering her life and decisions as she got ready for bed. Goku was right. I don't have to let other people's opinions and judgments affect me. Those people don't care about me so why should I care about what they think? Now that the more that I think about it, my wish for a perfect boyfriend was because everyone I met was a slimy sleazeball. Thanks for that Sun Kun. I really needed that.
Bomba put some blankets on the floor before moving to her bed. No problem, just call me Goku. I like it better like that. Goku said as he was using the blankets on the floor to snuggle up. Good night. Hey, really? Call me Bomba then to be fair. Good night Goku. Bomba said before laying down. Goku went to sleep instantly. Sleeping in the rough wilderness made him able to sleep anywhere at any time. Bomba stared at Goku's sleeping face before she let out a light sigh. She then turned around to try and sleep her thoughts away. Morning, off the dirt road in a clearing. One can see a small child with a boulder on top of him. The child with the monkey tail is doing push-ups to push himself to the limit. Ah, that was a nice morning workout. I need to focus on practicing my Kai a little more. I am only able to do a small blast and hover a little before I have to stop. To make sure he isn't going rusty, he closed his eyes to conjure a Kai blast. Soon, sweat starting accumulate to his already sweaty body. Above his hand, a small yellow light appeared before Goku suddenly opens his eyes. He thrusts his hand to throw the Kai blast to the boulder that he just used to work out. The boulder exploded sending pieces flying all over the place. Man, just one Kai blast as me already exhausted. I think it's because I don't have any proper training under my belt. Grandpa didn't teach me any Kai tricks. So going this far being self-taught is impressive as it is. I need to get stronger. Good thing today is the day that we meet Master Roshi. Goku walked inside the house to look around for Bulma. A little ticked off, he called her name. Bulma, are you done yet? Oh, no I am not. Do you think it is easy to look this good? You woke up too early. I am almost done. Bulma called from the bathroom. She was applying her makeup on and combing her hair. I'll wait outside. Goku rolled his eyes at the girl's antics. He walked outside checking all the boulders to look for the turtle to lead him to the destined Master Roshi. He didn't have to wait long as the third boulder started to move when he grabbed it. Ack! Turtle said as his limbs and head were spurting out of his shell. Oops, sorry turtle. What are you doing out here? Goku exclaimed as he put the turtle down. The turtle let out a sigh of relief as Bulma came out of the house in exasperation. She was wearing a plain blue cap on her head when she came out. With a purple tank top and short white shorts to highlight her curves. She told Goku, I told you I was almost done. You didn't have to call me again. Ah, uh, hello miss. Do you have any seawater for me to drink? Seaweed would be nice as well. The turtle kindly questioned. H H H H H. Goku you turned into a turtle. Bulma jumped in fright, thinking Goku magically turned into a turtle. No, I am still here, right here. Goku laughed at her expression when she realized her embarrassing outburst. She ran into the house and came back with a bucket filled with water and seaweed. Here is your water and seaweed. Now what are you doing out he see turtle? Bomba changed the topic so everyone could forget that happened. You are more than 100 kilometers north of the sea. You came a long way. The turtle explained his situation and how he got lost for one whole year. Must be tough, how about we help you out? It won't take us that long. Goku offered a solution to the turtle's problem instantly. Really you will help me out the turtle and Goku were looking expectingly at Bulma. Bulma under the gaze of both of them and rethinking Goku's heart to heart they had last night. Bulma agreed and capsuled the house. Goku was really surprised, but was really happy after the shock resided. I knew she can change. Goku thought as his tail waved back and forth. Thank you so much. Wait right here, I will give you something you really want. Turtle bade them a short farewell as he started swimming in the ocean. Goku sniffed the ocean breeze heavily. I miss the sea. I can't wait to experience life again. Bulma changed into her swimsuit and unfolded a chair to relax under the sun, while Goku was building a mighty sandcastle. After a while, the turtle comes back with a person on top of his back. He jumps off the turtle greeting the two heroes. Hello, thank you for saving my turtle. I am the turtle hermit, Master Roshi. And my turtle here told me that both of you helped him out in his time of peril. Let me reward you. The old man was wearing a Hawaiian shirt with a pair of shorts and sunglasses. Hidden behind his beard was a necklace with a shiny orange ball. The old thing was he was wearing a turtle shell on his back. When he walked on the sand, his feet sunk under his weight. Now that I am seeing it up close, his statue is very frizzly but incredible. I wonder how I would look with a mustache. I know that there was that one time that Vegeta and Goku had nice facial hair. Should I grow my hair out when I am older? While Goku was having some weird thoughts, Bulma had her suspicions. What do you have to give us? I hope this isn't some scam because it isn't funny. Well little lassie, I would never scam you on something like that. Here let me show you. Come to me magic carpet. After a while, 
nothing appeared making everyone sweat drop at the grand display. Came Sanan, remember the magic carpet is at the dry cleaners. Because there was a mysterious white stain on it, that smelled fishy. Ahaha. Uh -huh. I remember, I let a fish in. And he spat on the carpet. I remember, I remember. Master Roshi laughed a little too forced. Let's see, maybe you can do it. Come here, Kinton. After a while, nothing happened again. This time Bomber had enough. I knew it, this old man is a farce. Let's go, Goku. It's not like we came here for a reward anyways. Ah, a humble young lady. But have a little patience. Kinton should be here soon. Right on cue. A yellow cloud came speeding through the air. And came to a sudden stop next to Master Roshi. This is Kinton. He will let you ride on him if you are pure of heart. Not everyone is pure of heart. Let me show you how it's done. Master Roshi jumped and landed on top of Kinton only to fall down on his butt. Oh 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 oh, darn Kinton. Master Roshi rubbed his butt in pain. Let me try it, looks kind of fun. Bomber wanted to try to ride the somersault cloud and fly through the clouds. When she jumped, she also fell through albeit slower. So she didn't hurt her butt like Roshi. Hum, guess I am not enough, try it Goku. This time, the cloud accepted the resident that was on. Goku exclaimed in excitement as he started to spin in circles through the air. So this is flying. The air in my face is amazing as the view I can see up here. I can't wait to fly on my own. The cloud accepted Chris because since he transferred into Goku, he had no thoughts of evil or malicious intent, only to strive to be the best. Bulma wasn't that jealous because she knew that Goku was going to be able to ride it. But she still wanted something because she also helped. How about me? Asked Bulma expectingly. Did she help you? Master Roshi's question was directed to Turtle. She gave me food and water. She also let me ride on her bike here. I see. I don't know if I have anything for you young lady. But I can think of something I if you show me your panties. Master Roshi looked at Bulma with a perverted grin. A chill ran through Bulma as Goku's words yesterday rang in her ear. Shem ph a young maiden like me to show you my panties. How old are you mister? Definitely enough to be my grandpa many times over. You pedophile. Is this really your master turtle? I am really disappointed. Turtle, shocked at the turtle hermit's request, woke up from his stupor and started to berate his master for his pervertedness. While he was getting yelled at, an orange ball was visible around his neck. Bulma saw it and instantly went over to check. Wait turtle cun, if your master lends me that orange ball, then I will forget everything he said. Master Roshi, detecting Bulma's scheme, wanted to retort until Turtle started to coerce him into giving Bulma the Dragon Ball. When Turtle said he was going to sweep the house of any dirty magazines he finds, Roshi reluctantly gave the Dragon Ball to Bulma. Goku, I got the three-star Dragon Ball. Bulma yelled to Goku who was still doing some assaults with his cloud. Nice. That is four down. Let's go for the rest. After meeting Master Roshi, with Goku on his cloud and Bulma on her motorcycle, they raced to the next Dragon Ball. In some planet in space, HMPH, this trash wasn't even a warm-up. This mission was too easy. A short-statured man was sitting on a dead alien while eating a piece of meat. He wore some type of yellow and white armor, with a blue tight undershirt and white gloves and shoes. He wore a red device on his eye as he looked at the data that is provided. With his arrogant attitude and intense aura, one can instantly tell he is the leader of the pack of four around him. The rest was covered in dirt from head to toe, with some bruises and black marks due to some blaster rays. Ah, you shut up you punk. You didn't even do any work. You just sat here and ate our food supplies away. The one talking back was a fiery-tempered girl with hair pointed in all directions. She possessed the same clothes as the leader with red instead of blue, and an orange device on her eye. Ah, a mid-class bandit dare speak such rude words to her prince. You want me to teach you some respect? The acclaimed prince eyed the female from the corner of his eye. The female felt some invisible pressure on her, but she braved through. Yeah. I can't wait to finally smack that smug grin off of your face. The girl felt some sweat fall down her face from the pressure. W wait, V Vegeta Sama she didn't mean to. The other meek girl in the group started to explain to now named Vegeta. She was worried about her sister figure as she always got beaten in their spas. She wore a purple undershirt with a blue device strapped to her face. Her hair was tied into a ponytail. But that didn't stop the spikiness that came with her race. Shem PH, if we didn't need females to revive the Saiyan race, I would have turned you into dust long ago. The female Saiyan was trembling in fury, but Vegeta just snickered and ignored her. Raditz, 
Have you found your brother's location that he was sent to? We need all the Saiyans we can get and stick together. No, it seems Frieza somehow found out our plans even when we were discreet. He is blocking a lot of information that we have access to, replied another Saiyan now named Raditz. He looked like a porcupine with his long hair reaching his feet. He wore a black undershirt with a green device covering his eye. Blast that Frieza, he is hiding something. Something big. I swear I will find what is that makes him not want us to find another Saiyan. Speaking of Frieza, orders just came in. There is a new mission that we have to go right now. This time, a tall bald Saiyan spoke. He had a small statue with a brown undershirt and a purple device adorning his face. Not long after this one, he is working us like dogs. Let's go clean the mess fast, said Vegeta as the Saiyans walked towards five resting circular vehicles. They all stepped inside their respective ones as the hatch closed. Not a moment later, they all launched up at the same time blasting towards the stars. Man, Kinton is so fun to ride. I never knew that flying this felt so invigorating. Bomber pouted with jealousy at the airborne Goku, as he did more somersaults while still keeping speed with her motorcycle. Soon the duo arrived a little village that was too quiet for Bomber's liking. Hey, this is where the radar says the fifth Dragon Ball is. But I don't see any people. Bomber felt very uneasy in this apparent ghost town that she instinctually scooted closer to Goku. Hum well, let's knock. I can sense people so maybe they have a good reason. Goku went up knocking on the door expecting silence. Knocking again just for pretense, he shouted, Hello, is anyone here? We are wandering travelers and came to this town for something. Why is everyone gone? He hoped the residents heard so he could reduce the misunderstanding. Alas, either the residents were too fearful of even strangers to be kind to them. It looks like it's locked. Seemingly ignoring Bulma remark, Goku pries the door from its hinges, while making sure the door stays intact. Just as he did, a shadow from the inside rushes towards him with an axe at hand. Noticing his assailant, Goku pushes the door between them as a makeshift shield. Hey, what's the big idea old man? Goku exclaimed pretending to be angry. There are two of you. You aren't Oolong. Who are you? This time it was Bulma's turn to be a little angry. Didn't you hear? He said we are travelers. We didn't do anything wrong, and yet you attacked us for no reason. Explain yourself. Sorry young miss, but I thought you were Oolong. He is a terrible being that comes to our village to take away our young maidens. My daughter was next, so I thought you were Oolong coming to take her away. When the other villagers realized that the duo wasn't the terrible Oolong, they started crawling out of the woodworks everywhere in the village. Jam PH, you almost killed us. So you need to pay up. We are looking for these things called Dragon Balls. It looks like this. Have you seen something similar? Bulma was blowing the situation out of proportions. Since Goku wasn't going in any danger. But old habits die hard. After showing the orange ball. An old lady from the crowd came up claiming she has one as well. Ah. How about you give it to me? In exchange. I will forget that you people almost killed us. And we get rid of this Oolong character. Bulma went in for the one-two punch, making the villagers feel like they owe Bulma even more for such a small compensation. After explaining Goku's fighting prowess, they planned to just have Goku hide and launch a sneak attack on the unsuspecting Yolong. Knight, little lady. Little lady, I have come for you. Coming from the edge of town was a huge ogre-like creature with horns with the attire groom. These flowers are for you. Wah, where are you? At this point, Goku came from behind one of the buildings and leapt towards the monstrous being. HHH Oolong yelped in surprise as Goku launched with all of his strength. Goku's fist landed right on his forehead as Oolong passed out instantly due to the impact. That was anticlimactic. The villagers witnessed the scene and started hugging each other while crying. Then, the huge monster turned into a puff of smoke. Underneath that smoke lay the pig wearing green military clothes with a red star on the cap. All the villagers exclaimed in surprise as all of them stared at Oolong with a dumbfounded expression. Bomber came from within the crowd with a bucket. Inside the bucket was ice cold water as she poured it on Oolong. He woke up with a yelp and started squirming because of the water. He is literally a pig that is a pervert. I should have expecting something like this when they told us of your personality. Hey, look at me you pig, Oolong. Already terrified of Goku's strength, almost passed out again when faced with the ferocious Bulma. The girls your kidnap are safe. Oolong meekly nodded. Alright, take us to them. Goku tied Oolong to a rope as he Bulma received the Dragon Ball from the old lady. Oolong leaned closer to Goku, your girlfriend is scary. She isn't my girlfriend. Goku had a straight face when he answered. On the other hand, 
I heard you pig. Bulma was red with either fury or embarrassment. Oolong paled and obediently led them to his abode. After arriving, the villagers burst through the doors expecting the worst for their daughters. Only to find that their daughters were having the time of their life relaxing. Everyone looked at Oolong with confusion, while Goku looked at him with amusement. I wanted an obedient girl please do take them back. So you are a beta male. Goku said to Oolong looking directly in his eyes. Shh, hey it's not true. E.T. these girls are just that scary. Hey, I am not judging. Leaving the villagers to berate the girls for worrying them, Bulma led Goku and Oolong to talk. Hey Oolong, you can shapeshift, right? How can you do that? Bulma looked at Oolong like he was a specimen ready to dissect. Understanding his position, he gulped before answering. I went to South Shapeshifting Preschool. It wasn't that hard, but since I didn't graduate, I can only shapeshift for five minutes. Do you think you can teach us? That skill seems very useful. Oolong was stuck between a rock and a hard place, namely Goku. On a boat towards their next destination, Oolong was teaching them how to shapeshift. Well for starters, humans have it much harder to shapeshift to different things. That's why in my shapeshifting school, they mostly accepted humanoid animals instead. Oolong hoped that with this information, they would give up and let him leave. I have a tail. Does that count? Oolong looked at Goku with exasperation. Of course it does not you dimwit. HMPH, shapeshifting is a supreme art that not just anyone can do. It takes years to practice the magical nature of it. Bomba finally saw the chance to ask something that has been on her mind for a while. Hey Goku, I have been meaning to ask you. What's with that tail? It moves like it is a real tail. But it is a highly technical accessory, right? Goku smiled. Nope, I was born with it. E-H-H-H-H. Bulma and Oolong gasped in surprise. They started discussing it totally forgetting anything else as they ventured on to meet the desert bandit. Eh, I told you everything I know about transforming. It's not like I am very good at it. I can only transform for five minutes myself. Currently, Goku, Bulma, and Oolong were in the middle of traveling through the desert. Bulma was her signature bike with Oolong behind her as Goku was trying to shapeshift on the flying Nimbus. Goku had the foresight to keep the capsule case next to him by convincing Bulma that he will better protect it. I feel like the transformation technique has something to do with Kai, but is also entwined with magic. I have little Kai control and no magical affinity, unlike Oolong who is a natural. My guess is that even though Oolong has no Kai control, he relies on his magical prowess due to his species to transform, albeit not for very long. We should put the transformation training on hold for now. If Goku can't do it then I probably can't either. Bomber said as she had one hand on the wheel while the other was preventing Oolong from groping her. Hey, I see a cloud of smoke. I think someone is approaching. Goku from his elevated height could see Yamcha and Pure approaching them in their bike. Soon both parties stopped in their tracks. Yamcha was the first to speak up. Hey, you guys seem to be in the wrong place. This is my desert and I am the hyena who lurks it. If you fellas don't want to get killed so soon in your life, Hand over your money and any capsules you have. Bulma was wearing a helmet along with the windshield made her figure unidentifiable, while Oolong was cowardly hiding behind Bulma. Goku is the first to show any reaction. He smirks at Yamcha as he is the first real match he will have since his grandpa. Show me your moves. Goku gets off Kinten and beckons Yamcha with his fingers, as he has a smug expression plastered on his face. I didn't really want to slice you up, kid. But it seems you don't know your place. Yamcha charged at Goku with an arrogant grin. He wields his swords and swings it horizontally where Goku is standing. Goku backs away barely dodging the fatal blow. As Yamcha confidently exploits the opening he is given. Just before he can swing again, he feels something wrap around his foot. He is abruptly pulled as his feet are airborne. He hits his head on the sandy ground, feeling a little dazed as he can see the sky. Before he can make sense of the situation, he finds a foot coming towards his head with lethal intent. He quickly rolls away from the axe kick and uses the momentum to spring up to his feet. What was that? Yamcha exclaimed confused about how he tripped. Pure from the sidelines was having an argument with Oolong. After he wanted to know the situation by disembarking the bike. However, he was still observing the battle intensely. Yamcha Sama. He has a tail. That's how tripped you. Yamcha looked closely at the small boy, only to find that behind him, a tail was slowly waving back and forth in a hypnotic manner. Surprised, Yamcha tensed up a little more. It seems you aren't just a little kid. I shouldn't have let my guard down, but you will go down here nonetheless. What's your name, kid? Mine's Yancha. Son Goku. Goku responds getting into a defensive stance. Rushing towards Goku once again, 
This time Yamcha threw his blade at Goku. Goku easily dodges the sword as it lodged into the ground a few CMS away from his tail. Yamcha, still rushing, used his ultimate technique on the young child. Wolf Fang Fist. A shadow of a wolf appeared behind Yamcha as he kicked Goku with his full force. Goku parried his move as Yamcha fists turned into claws that resembled a wolf. Yamcha hit Goku blow after blow with lighting fast claw attack, only for Goku to either block or parry his advances. I am losing ground. How is this kid so strong? I can't even land a decent hit. Yamcha, done with his combo, unleashes the finishing move as both his fists come together for one last powerful hit. Goku, easily predicting his advance, sidesteps out of danger. Yamcha, with no target to hit, overextends a bit with his body. Goku uses the opening and punches him in the stomach, while Yamcha doubles over from the impact. Quickly thinking through the pain, Yamcha grabs the sword that he threw behind Goku, and does one last feeble swing towards Goku's head. Goku retracts his arm and ducks a bit, as his hair is slightly grazed, making a few small strands to hit the floor. Goku, already crouching, spins quickly on his left foot and counters with a round house kick with his right. Yamcha's sword in hand collides with his bite with bruises and bits of scratches from the rough treatment of the sand. Yamcha's Sama. Are you all alright? We have to retreat, he is out of our league. Pua goes up to Yamcha and helps him get to his feet. Oh, we, we can't retreat. Our reputation in this desert will plummet if the other bandits find out I got beat up by a kid. Yamcha stood up with a steely determined gaze towards Goku. I suggest listening to the advice your friend there gave Desert Bandit. Goku is the strongest person I know. You won't be able to defeat him easily. Bomber finally gets off her bike and takes off her helmet. Her hair is flowing with the dry breeze as it emphasizes her beauty its peak. With her brown booty shorts, purple tank top, and leather jacket draping over her back because she didn't use the armholes. Her eyes land on Yamcha seemingly staring into his soul while her nose wrinkles cutely due to the sandy winds. Yamcha is frozen on the spot until he lifts up the bike from its side and runs away at his full pace. I will get you next time some Goku. Very soon, you can see Yamcha's fading back like he has seen the worst thing on the planet. Ugly wait. Yamcha-sama, don't leave me behind. Don't lose your cool, use your bike instead of carrying it. Wait Pua turned into a bike himself as he sped towards Yamcha, screaming his engines out. What a weird pair. What do you guys say to spending the night here? Ulon and Goku wake from their stupor and quickly agreeing to Bomber's request as they enter their newly materialized house. After eating a hearty meal, the gang started feeling a little sleepy and decided to turn in for the night. As Bomber was taking a shower, Ulon was having some doubts about this adventure. Why are you guys going on this adventure? We are all probably going die at Frypan Mountain because you lot are insane. Hum, we are going to collect a relic there. It's part of the set. I don't know if I should say more since Bulma is the one that is collect them. I am just here to help her while having fun and growing stronger. Unknown to Bulma and Ulong, Yamcha was sneaking around on the outside planning an attack. Bulma came out of the restroom with a pink nightgown and a towel wrapped around her hair. Hey, guys, I'm going to turn in for the night. Ulong, you are sleeping on the couch. Goku, you sleep on the floor next to me. What? Why does this brat get to sleep next to you? To keep pervs like you away. Oolong scurries away with a blush on his face from being found out so easily. A couple of seconds later, Pure and Yamcha sneaked inside the house to find and steal the capsules and money as per usual for their banditry. As Pure and Yamcha came saw Bomber, a shadow with spiky hair was already awake next to her. Pervert. That night, you can hear the screams of Yamcha and Pure as they got the tar beat out of them. Old Earth, we are here today to mourn the death of my son, Chris Lander. Chris's dad was on top of platform looking down on everyone as he talked. The crowd wasn't large, only family and friends were invited. If you have known the Landers for a long time, you would notice that this is one of the only times you can see the emotion on their faces. I thought that we were going to be the first to die due to age or the nature of our job. That's why I never wanted kids. It was too risky. Chris's mom lamented her son's death to her husband after he said his words. This time, a female with luscious blonde hair stepped onto the podium. Shifting slightly at all the looks she was given, she took a deep breath and began her speech. It has been a full month without Chris. And I have been feeling his absence harder and harder every day. I haven't known him for too long. But I felt like I have known him my whole life. He was the best person that brought the best out of me in return. He was the spark of life in these dark times, especially when we don't know how much longer we have left to live. 
As Fane was wrapping up her speech, a bright light flashed in the distance. Everyone felt a shock with course through them as chills crept up to their spines. Everyone was panicking while Fane was dazed muttering to herself. At least you aren't here suffer this Chris. A single tear left her eye and ran through her cheek before landing on Chris's coffin. In the distance, a flame reaching towards the heavens was erected in the along the dirt road. A are we really going to Frypan Mountain? I it isn't too late to turn back. Looking at Goku's seemingly innocent smile that had a murderous intent underneath it, Oolong's subservient nature kicked in and quickly backed down. They shortly arrived at a town nearby the castle. The town was in ruins as people skeletons are scattered about. Wow, you can feel the heat from here. Goku was currently looking at the mesmerizing sight of the dancing flames from the distance. Goku, can you go up to the castle and retrieve the Dragon Ball? Bulma was pointing at the lone castle that sat atop the roaring flames like a boat floating in an ocean. Yeah right, I will be cooked like a lobster in a pot. We need another plan to get rid of the flames. Hey, you. From behind, a monster-like voice spoke from behind them. You can hear the rustic sound of metal screeching as Bulma and Oolong slowly turn their heads around like a machine that hasn't had oil applied in a long time. Soon, a giant of a man appeared with an axe in his hand, making him look more intimidated. He had a helmet that had devil horns jutted out on both ends living true to his name as the Demon King. Bulma and Oolong ran and hide behind Goku using him as a shield to the great evil. Where did you get that flying Nimbus? Spit was practically flying everywhere as the Ox King questioned Goku right in his face. Kane Senning gave it to me. Goku flatly stated as he wiped Spit off his face. What? Do you know where he is now? Goku stared at him dumbfounded. He proceeded to wipe the Spit off again. Yeah. He lives off the coast. As soon as Goku said that, the Ox King started laughing in happiness. He even wiped a tear off his eye because of how much he was laughing. Losing all hope, he did not stop the Ox King from this revelation, as he let the spit accumulate on his face and hair. After trading his help for searching for Master Roshi and Kai Kai for the Dragon Ball, Goku set off in his flying Nimbus. Goku found Kai Kai easily enough after dodging multiple lasers and an incredibly sharp boomerang for a minute straight. Goku managed to calm her down and explained the situation when they were flying to the Kane house on Kinton. How about trading the Bancho fan for letting me touch that young lady's boobs? Roshi was trying to convince Goku to take the deal, as he thought it was a pretty fair trade. Actually, pretty unfair as saving a castle full of treasures was incomparable to preying on a 16-year-old girl as a 300-plus-year-old man. Goku suddenly had a mischievous idea and grinned inwardly. But his face betrayed his emotions as it was calm as a cucumber. Hey, I fine. She will even do more than that if you want. Roshi suddenly started to drool at the prospect of more. However, this deal is the Bancho fan for the groping okay. Roshi nodded too fast making Goku feel a little creep out. If we do not receive the fan, you still must take out the fire. Your former student house is in flames. You must have a conscience. Of course, of course. I understand let me look for the fan right away. I know I have. Roshi agreed quickly thinking that some of his perverted families will come to life. However, his fantasies quickly shattered as he desperately started looking for the fan uprooting the entire house in the process. Roshi was rapidly becoming hysteric calling in the turtle for help, not realizing that turtle was not going to improve the situation anytime soon. Kane Senen, don't you remember? You used it as a tablecloth that one time. Turtle was feeling extremely embarrassed and exasperated at Roshi's enthusiasm for getting that fan. Nooo. Roshi fell onto his knees crying profusely. Roshi was feeling incredibly dejected. But he couldn't help but feel that he just go duped by Goku. But he couldn't have known that he didn't actually have the Bancho fan right. Roshi doubted that assumption as Goku was calm as water talking to Kaikai Kai about random topics. Seeing Roshi's reaction, Goku quickly asked him while inwardly celebrating an easy win. Great esteemed Turtle Hermit, you do not have the Bancho fan. I did not expect this. How would we put out the flames now? Doubt began swelling inside Roshi after watching Goku's bad acting despite his calm appearance. Roshi charted it off as him trying to contain his excitement, because there was no way that Goku could have known the future. Right, right Roshi was crying inwardly as he called out for his magic carpet. That recently came back from the dry cleaning of the fish spit, and headed towards Frypan to put off the flames. Bulma and Goku were currently high-fiving and giggling, at what Goku did to trick the famous Master Roshi, as the object of humiliation are on top of a stone wall. 
looking towards the giant flaming mountain. Goku this time was watching intently at the master as he was about to fire off the famous Kamehameha wave. Goku, along with his Kai control exercises, tried multiple times to do a Kamehameha correctly in his practice, but could never truly nail it. Understanding his knowledge of Kai is extremely limited, Goku put all his attention towards the now buff Master Roshi. Kane Master Roshi held his arms wide towards the sky, summoning the Kai from his body to his hands. He then slowly brought his outstretched claw hands together, chanting the verse. Haim his arms slowly pulled back to behind him while still linking his hands. The at first yellow Kai changed to blue so fast you would think that it would have started it in blue. The compressed Kai was constantly getting fed with Roshi's Kai, as he was doing the movement, making the ball of energy more compact and explosive. Huh. Just as the ball of Kai was going to explode like a grenade, Roshi thrust his arms forward, launching a blinding blue beam towards its unsuspecting target. Goku, the battle genius that the Saiyan is, was able to perceive all the changes and flow of Kai, realizing all his mistakes that he has done in the past. Doing the motions of the Turtle School, he mimicked the great master technique correcting himself on the way. In the meantime, Bulma and Kai Kai were talking and quickly getting to know each other. You live in West City. I have never been to the city before. It must be really nice. Chi Chi had stars in her eyes at the prospects of leaving the confines of her house. Really? You should come over to my house sometime. We can hang out and go shopping. To be honest, I don't have many girlfriends. But you seem to be really nice and easygoing. Besides, you can even ride Kinton. So I know you're going to be a great friend. She girlfriend. Like a girl that is a friend. I I don't know. I have to ask my dad first. He is really protective of me. Goku finally revised his technique and launched his hands into motion. While compressing the Kai into a stable ball. He finally released it when he felt his Kai reserves unable to keep up. And the blue beam sped to the wall that Master Roshi was standing on earlier. Master Roshi and the Ox King were wide-eyed in shock at the display of the Kamehameha wave for Goku's first try. Shh, how did you do that? Ox King was teary-eyed because he never was able to learn the technique. I trained a lot when I was a kid with my grandpa Gohan. The duo's wide eyes suddenly stretched outward, leaving their eye sockets behind. After questioning the youth's heritage, Roshi posed him a question unhesitantly. Hey kid, you want to come to my island to train? You should know that I am the great turtle hermit. You can become as strong or even stronger than me. Goku was about to agree until he remembered Bulma's proposal when they first started their journey. Although he didn't say yes, it still felt wrong doing his own thing without giving her a reason. Goku excused himself and approached the girls as they were chatting away. Kai Kai blushed a little. But Goku didn't notice because he was looking at Bulma. Hey Bulma, Master Roshi offered me to train under him. I was planning to go after our adventure, but I know that you wanted me to take that bodyguard job. Is it alright if I consider it after my training? Honestly, Bulma forgot all about the child labor that she asked of Goku because of the craziness of the adventure so far. Bulma was flattered that he told her and remembered what she said. Sure, after all, if you train then my bodyguard will be that much stronger. After her confirmation, Goku gave his confirmation to Master Roshi. After confirming that they got the Dragon Ball from Oolong with the rest of them, the duo left when Oolong wanted to go along with Roshi because of some shared interest. As his use was already expired, they left him and ventured off to the last Dragon Ball. Chris 13 years old, find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. A voice came out from the computer station on Chris's desk. Chris himself was watching on his chair with stars coming out of his eyes. He ran to the living room to see his parents as they were home for the weekend. Chris's parents laid there on the couch panting with sweat. Other liquids littered the ground beneath them. Just as they were going to go another round, Chris's interrupted them. Mom, Dad, I want to learn martial arts. They looked at him in surprise before looking back at each other. Chris has never been interested in something like sports, let alone the rough training of a martial artist. Well... What do you want to learn? His mom asked looking at his face for a response. Chris, who ran down here without thinking or researching the topic further, was at a loss for words. Ah, uh, karate. Chris's mom, being the elite spy that she is, quickly defused this situation on the impulse of the male teenager. When she spotted the look of loss in his eyes, his father, doing the same thing, spoke next. Son, if you don't even know what you want to learn, we can't help you. Maybe when you are older and have more confidence in yourself, you can do martial arts. If you still think this way later and have researched the hardships of it as well, we will consider it. 
Chris, dejected, walked back to his room as his parents quickly went back to lovemaking, as if nothing had interrupted them. He walked back to his computer to search up different martial arts styles. Clicking video after video, recommendation after recommendation, he was soon lost in the void of the martial arts world, even forgetting that he wanted to actually learn martial arts. Traveling along the road, the strange duo of Bulma and Goku, are venturing off to find the last Dragon Ball, in hopes to see the Divine Dragon. Want some rabbit meat? Goku through his days in the wilderness has learned to eat anything that is edible in order to survive. Even creepy, sentient rabbit mob bosses. That guy was a creep. How can you eat him with a nonchalant attitude? Bulma shivered a little thinking back to the rabbit boss that they encountered a couple of hours back. He almost turned her into a carrot if it weren't for Goku's quick thinking to just kill the criminal. Goku just shrugged and threw the rabbit boss's corpse into the jungle that they were passing. Anyways, we are so close to the last Dragon Ball. You can get your wish, and I can get to see the dragon that you were talking about. I wonder what it's like living inside the Dragon Balls. Does he sleep forever and only comes out when we call him? Must be a boring existence. Goku was in deep thought about Shenron's daily life when Bulma spoke up from her seat in the driving position. About that Goku dash Bulma had her mouth open when a blast hit the car they were in making it explode into dust. A mech appeared out from the mushroom trees that were surrounding them and started attacking them. Cough son of a bitch. Cough that smoke went into my mouth while I was talking. Bulma had tears in her eyes from the sudden intake of smoke with a coughing fit to boot. The mech ignored the two and started rummaging in the wreckage looking for something. It wasn't long until the dog inside the mech found a black briefcase undamaged on a seat. Upon opening the case, he sees six shiny orange balls sitting neatly in a row, inviting him to take them. Before he can celebrate and snatch his prize, a kick comes from behind, making him stumble forward on one leg before repositioning himself. Goku grabbed the briefcase towards the direction of Bulma, expecting her to catch it. Only for it land on her head as she was coughing black soot from her throat. Her head falls on the soot with a light thud, making the powder lightly rise from the impact. Goku, mostly unaware of Bulma's blackened face, squares up with the robot ready to fight. The angry doge inside the mech starts the battle by blasting all the firearms available on the mech's arms at the smirking kid. Goku runs up and jumps on the slow missile leading his brethren to a fiery hell. Using it as a platform, he jumps with all his might elevating his height, while making the missile go down to the ground. The missile explodes causing a chain reaction to the other explosives. They all explode at once in a mesmerizing scene straight out of an anime. Shu couldn't help but be in a daze from the enchanting side of Goku, fist outstretched and the flying colors of the explosion. His emotions were strung from the picturesque sight as a single tear came from his eye, only to be slowly absorbed into his fur. Goku put all his weight and gravity into his punch, so when it impacted, the mech screen shattered with Goku's fist inside the control panel. The mech instantly exploded making Goku blast back next to Bulma, while Shu took the brunt of the explosion, making his entire front black with the powder. Coming back from his days because of the severe burns he has been afflicted with, Shu retrieves a jetpack from his capsule and flies off into the distance with his tail tucked between his legs. Before he leaves, he yells out to the victors, I would have gotten away with those Dragon Balls if it weren't for you meddling kids. Serves him right for trying to steal the Dragon Balls. That was a good stretch. Bomber, do you have any more vehicles that you can use? I will stick to Kinton just in case something like his happens again. Goku had a silly grin on his face from an easy win. He turns to look at Bomber when he hasn't heard her response, only to find himself looking at a charcoal Bomber with a hand mirror reflecting her face as she looked at it. Mr. Popo. Bomber suddenly turns to Goku with a stare that can pierce souls. Goku felt like he was staring at death herself when Bomber was slowly walking up to Goku. A sickening thunk could be heard for miles originating from a dirt road void from civilization. Did I hear you correctly? You failed your mission, was it? Whose fault was it so I can punish them? A small blue imp creature was currently sitting on a chair, staring at what seemed to be a larger version of the dragon raid eye. Behind him stood two individuals that presumably failed their mission. Shu, a brown humanoid dog with a ninja attire on, and Mai, a tall human female with a military-like blue trench coat on, were bowing down to the imp's back sweating from all their possible glands. Sir, it wasn't Dash Shu started his plea towards his master but was abruptly cut off. You know what? It doesn't matter whose fault it was, you are both going to be tortured. 
Pilaf then presses a button on the control panel in front of him. Twelve hands immediately come out from the floor and ceiling. The hands had white gloves on them, and were around half a size bigger than regular human hands. Shu and Mai had horrified expressions on them as the white gloves started wiggling their fingers at their prey. Before Shu and Mai could run, four hands dash each dash towards their respective occupants. The hands latch on their feet and hands, making them float in the air in a starfish position. The remaining hands lurk towards the unfortunate participants, making the duo shiver in anticipation. Suddenly, the hands thrust forwards and started to tickle the airborne minions ruthlessly. Feet, armpits, neck, no body part was left with mercy, as the hands tickled with all their might. A slash N. Felt like I was stating fetishes with the feet and stuff XD. The tortured started laughing uncontrollably and couldn't stop, even when their voice started to strain. One hour of the torture is not nearly enough for you two. But since we are on a tight schedule, it will have to do. To compensate, I added my newly made tickling powder to make your body more sensitive. Next time don't disappoint me or I will extend it. Unfortunately, the duo wasn't able to hear their emperor as tears started to trickle from laughing too hard. We finally made it. This last dragon ball should be inside this less than ominous castle. We should be expecting that guy that you said you fought inside here. Bulma was currently looking between the radar and the castle in disbelief. Goku, with a plan already in mind, started to trek to the front entrance and open the door. Following the pulley made arrow trap that made him feel stupider by looking at it. They soon found themselves at a dead end with the wall behind them shut down. Bomba quickly started lamenting at how stupid it was to get trapped so easily. Suddenly, the television that was embedded inside the wall lit up showing Emperor Pilaf on the other end. Hey, give me all your Dragon Balls. If you don't, your girlfriend will have something really perverted done to her. Pilaf threw his ultimatum while wearing a grim expression. She is not my boyfriend, you bastard. You are the one who attacked us. Let us out of here. Bulma shouted towards the TV like it was her only lifeline. I see. Then let us see how you will react when I do something extremely perverted. The ceiling opened a trapdoor revealing a mechanical claw big enough to squeeze the biggest of pimples. The claw latched onto struggling Bulma and pulled her into the trapdoor. Goku, ready for this moment, latched onto Bulma's legs before the claw could take her fully inside. They traveled through a metal tube at extreme speeds. Because of this, Goku held Bulma tighter as she froze like a statue from the feeling. The metal tube reached the end appearing in front of the villainous trio. Hey, the little boy came with her. No matter. You will have to watch boy as I do something that will traumatize her forever. The little wrinkly face wrinkled more from puffing out his lips like a duck. The two behind him looked away just before he put his hand in front of his lips and blew Bomber a kiss. It's even more ridiculous up close, let me just end their misery. Before the villains could react, Goku fired off a Kamehameha wave to finish them all quickly. Kamehameha. Shu and Mai were behind Pilif, so when Pilif got carried by the blue energy beam, they got impacted and swept away too. The Kamehameha broke through the castle leaving behind a gaping hole. The Kamehameha started to curve upwards towards the very stars. In the distance, a voice can be heard, next time we will get you. This isn't the last you see of me. The Pilif gang will be blasting off for the first and last time. Once the voice was done, a little twinkle can be seen where they blasted off. The reason he held back and didn't kill them was that he wanted Piccolo to be born. Letting them live to find the Demon King would be much simpler than finding the Jar himself. It's not like he is a threat to his rising power anyways. Grabbing Bulma like she was a sack of potatoes, Goku made a quick stop at the control panel pressing the conveniently placed big red self-destruct button. After that, he ran out the hole that the Pilaf gang kindly made for him, before the control room made a chain explosion to the entire castle. Using the momentum from the blast, Goku gracefully landed on the ground before letting Bulma stand. Just as he did, Bulma started to hole on the ground right before him soaking his shoes in a gross green liquid. I finally found it. Goku and Bulma were removing the rubble from the destroyed castle, looking for the Dragon Ball until Goku found it. We finally did it. This entire adventure and we finally found the last Dragon Ball. Goku and Bulma hugged each other crying rivers of tears in an exaggerated way. Goku gave Bulma the last Dragon Ball when they went to a clearing to summon the Eternal Dragon. Bulma with all Dragon Balls on hand hesitated for a second before shoving all the balls into Goku's arms. Seeing that Goku was a little confused, Bulma explained herself feeling a little bashful. You helped realize a couple of things in our time together. I realized that I don't need to summon a perfect boyfriend. 
but to look for a boyfriend while accepting his imperfections as he does to me. That is the only way to achieve love. Well, a better way than wishing for one. Don't you have other stuff you want to wish for? I don't want to use the things that you set out to find. Oh, please. I have everything already. Looks, money, entertainment consider this a payment for helping me not die multiple times. Goku shocked at Bulma's transformation, gladly took the Dragon Balls and spread them on the ground. So what are you going to wish for? To become stronger. Bulma looked at Goku curiously. Ever since she started hanging out with him, he has never shown to want something besides gaining more strength. Something similar, you see at a full moon. I transform into something like a giant ape. I have never learned how to control it. So I hopefully Shenron will enable me to while also granting me more. You were the great ape of Montana Peozu. Wait, 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 what do you mean by more dash? Before Bulma can ask what he meant by more, Goku recited the ancient summoning words. Eternal Shenron, by your name I summon you forth. Goku passionately said out every word like they were his dream since childbirth. The seven Dragon Balls shined in unison like they were responding to Goku's heartfelt declaration. A yellow beam erupted from the middle of the crowd of balls and blasted towards the starry sky. The sky started to blacken while making the atmosphere slightly oppressive with lightning. The beam soon started to slowly transform into a figure of a magnificent dragon, with its body swelling and coiling around in the air. The yellow light shed itself, like dead skin on a snake, revealing a green dragon with red eyes that glowed with power. The mighty figure had horns on his head and fangs that looked like razors, while the tail seemed to be protruding from the dragon balls never to be seen. Shenron looked down to see two children that had summoned his presence and started to talk to them. I am the eternal dragon Shenron. I can grant you one wish. State your wish. The two were staring in awe at the divine dragon until he had broken the silence. Goku started to rearrange the wish that he thought of in his mind until he was finally satisfied with the wording. Shenron, please grant me perfect control of any transformations that I can achieve with this body. Is this wish possible? Goku chose this wish because, if made possible, it can allow him to transform into all the Super Saiyans transformations, Great Eight transformations, and possibly the God transformations, with little to no effort. Shenron's eyes glowed with reality bending power whilst studying the individual before him. It took a few seconds before he spoke again. Your species have unlimited potential with many stages at that. I will not be able to grant you perfect control over your transformations, as it is beyond my power. However, I can grant you a better understanding of your body, making you have the potential of perfect control, while making it easier to control your transformations. Is this suitable? Goku, although not achieving his overpoweredness in seconds, was still excited about the wish that will be granted. He expected Shenron not to be able to make him overpowered, but still wanted a wish similar to the one he made, so it all worked out in the end. Yes, it is. Thank you. Very well. Shenron's eyes glowed once more. Your wish has been granted. Farewell. Shenron, with his job done, retracted into the Dragon Balls as quickly as he came. The Dragon Balls together rose in a blindly yellow light, until each one dispersed in different directions. Goku, while staring at the departing Dragon Balls, felt like something click into his brain. He suddenly felt like his body was acting differently and felt weird. It wasn't long before a blinding pain similar to the one that brought him to this world started to attack his brain from all sides. Goku started to scream in pain while Bulma was panicking about the situation. Thinking quickly, she loaded the squirming child into the back of her car and drove off to the nearest hospital. Kami's lookout, Kami, someone has summoned the eternal dragon Shenron. A Vanta Black genie observed the darkening sky in the distance until a yellow flash made it disappear. I see Mr. Popo. Let me observe this youth that gathered the Dragon Balls. A green, wrinkly creature named Kami closed his eyes in concentration. Hum, it doesn't look like he is evil and didn't wish for anything too extreme. He is even able to ride the flying Nimbus. I don't think we have anything to worry about. It's not like he will become the universe's most powerful. Mr. Popo and Kami laughed at their little joke that brightened the lonely atmosphere that accompanied them on the highest point on Earth. Kami and Mr. Popo both sighed into the wind as they looked over Earth. Kami spoke first. This shit is boring. Be careful of what you wish for, Kami. Goku woke up to a blinding light while feeling extremely lightheaded. What's going on? Where am I? Is this what they call the legendary hangover? As Goku groggily stood up, he could hear someone opening a door. Ah, Goku my boy you are awake. I will go inform Bulma. 
You have been sleeping all day since Bulma brought you in. To his right was a stubby old man with glasses adorning his face. He was typing on something on his wrist while talking to him. Dr. Briefs. Indeed. Oh, looks like Bulma is very dash before he can finish. Bulma burst through the door and hugged Goku. When she saw that he was awake, Goku, stuck between two mountains of flesh, struggled to breathe from Bulma's death grip. Before he can pass out once more, Bulma let him go so he can breathe air again. Are we what happened Bulma? Where am I? Goku quickly asked before anything escalated any further. After the wish, I rushed you to the nearest hospital. While in the car you were squirming non-stop. And it looked like you were in pain. Halfway there you stopped. But I still went just in case. When I arrived they told me that you were just unconscious from the pain. And that they didn't know what was wrong with you. They did know that you were going to be fine after you wake up. So I just took you here to my house to see if my dad can see what was wrong with you. Ah, sorry Bulma. When I made the wish I didn't think that was going to happen. At the mention of the wish, the sad Bulma instantly turned angry. She slapped him right on his cheek, leaving behind a red mark. You little, I can't believe you made a wish that would hurt you like that. Do you know how worried I was HMPH? Bulma stormed out after her little rant leaving Goku with her father. That was a sight to see. Well, Goku... I couldn't find anything wrong with you even with all my tools. If it wasn't obvious from your great ape transformation and tail, you aren't human. That's all I can infer. I will have to up my technology after this. Goku feeling a little embarrassed decided to ask, will Bulma be alright? She seemed pretty mad. Bulma's father looked at Goku with an amused expression. She was pretty shaken up when she saw you in that state of pain. She should be fine soon though. Just give her some space. I will give her some space. I must have shaken her up really bad. Tell her that I will be training at Master Roshi's place for the time being. After receiving the curt nod of Dr. Briefs, Goku made his way out of the laboratory to head out to Master Roshi's place. As much as Goku wanted to explore his newfound powers that Shenron unlocked, he would be late to arrive at Master Roshi's training. After a short while on Kinton, Goku is finally able to see Master Roshi's place in the middle of the ocean. On that island, Goku can see Master Roshi talking to a short cue ball with perverted expressions on their face. Sitting on a chair, one could also see a pig just lounging around doing nothing. Hey Master Roshi, I am here for my training. Goku swooped down and hopped off Kinton next to the two bald martial artists. Oh, it's you. You are here for training as well. I almost forgot. Who are you kid? The great master Roshi here already as a disciple. The short bald kid had six dots on his shiny forehead to compensate for his lack of nose. He snorted at the new arrival in disdain. Now now Krillin. I did also promise Goku that I will train him. But of course, he will accompany you on your trip to find someone suitable for my stature. Yeah yeah. Find us someone good. Oolong felt the need to chime in because he felt like he was getting forgotten. After just an hour of traveling, Goku arrived at Master Roshi's abode once more, while Krillin was glued to the back of blue-haired beauty that came along. After hearing them coming back, Master Roshi quickly went outside to see what his discipline's latest catch was. Long slender legs, booty shorts, and a crop top were all Roshi could see, when he was staring in delight at the young curvaceous woman that was on his porch. Drool seeped into his shirt as he yelled in delight, yeah. Everyone had to cover their ears at the old man's yelling before it tears their eardrums apart. Oolong and Master Roshi was inspecting launch a little too close to anyone's liking. So before it can get out of hand with Krillin sucking up, Goku spoke first. In his most excited tone he can muster, he told his soon-to-be master, we found her getting chased by the police. After she robbed a bank grate. Wait what? Master Roshi looked a little flustered at the explanation that this innocent looking girl is a criminal. ED does. Not M matter. Ha huh, ha. Huh. You two are my disciples now. Hurry wear this uniform. Master Roshi handed everyone what looked like black lingerie. Looking at launch quiet expectantly. Launch was slowly peeling off her top to change nearly revealing two bright pink bumps on her modest chest until a fly flew past her nose. Ayachu her previous blue hair instantly turned blonde like the other color was just an illusion. She promptly stopped what she was doing to inspect the situation. She quickly pulled a submachine gun out of thin air and started blasting everyone to smithereens. You goddamn perverts. After arriving on the larger island that would serve as the turtle school's training down, they quickly settled in. Launch quickly went inside the capsule house preparing dinner, while Master Roshi was preparing to test Goku and Krillin's speed. Alright you two, 
I want you to sprint from that rock to this tree. It is about 100 meters so do your best. Krillin started first because he really wanted to show his superiority and quickly become Master Roshi's favorite. He started in the standard sprint position with his arms touching the ground and his feet ready to bounce. Start. Krillin moved the millisecond he heard the first word. Moving faster than any normal I can track, he arrived past in seconds. 10.3 seconds. You are really something. Before Krillin could boast any time his year, Goku quickly reminded Master Roshi that he was next in line. Ah, yes, Goku. Ready. Start. Goku burst forward from his seemingly relaxed stance straight towards the tree, like it was his worst enemy. Goku was a blur that Roshi nor Krillin could believe, and he soon also reached the tree. Time. Roshi snapped out of his days at the speed of the young martial artists, and looked at the time that he recorded. 7-7.9 7 seconds. Krillin quickly proceeded to almost faint before Roshi caught him and helped him stand up. Before you clock out, watch this old master show you how it's done. Master Roshi was hoping that with his speed, he can rejuvenate Krillin's motivation after seeing the gap in power from his rival. After all, Krillin's speed was around his when he was just his age as well. Master Roshi burst through the track like a star, making everyone look his way while shielding their eyes. He instantly made it to the tree and asked his time. Hyok. Five seconds. You see Krillin I was dashed before Master Roshi could continue. Krillin already fainted standing up. Hurry it up. Krillin you got to keep up. Hey, did you skip that zigzag? Do it two more times. Huh. Watch where you are throwing that dirt. I am trying to enjoy the view through these binoculars here. Bonk. Gosh darn it Krillin. 9 plus 10 is not 21. What stupid person told you that? You are not supposed to do actual construction. Only help them. You made this entire bridge fall. Or, we aren't at the beach. Don't splash water on me. We shall do all of that. But instead with these 20 kilogram shells. Krillin was moved to tears furu dash. I don't really have any fight techniques to teach you too. All of the work you have been doing has been honing your body and senses to the max. However, I do have these 40 kilograms as gifts to further your training. Master Roshi pulled out two more shells that sunk into the ground upon their descent. Even though I remember Roshi not teaching them fighting technique, this confirms it. Although they say it is martial arts and know what martial arts are like karate. It's them mostly just punching and kicking, with some kai techniques mixed in. No real martial arts are here like in my old world, only just refined movements compared to people like Kaulifla, who was labeled a brawler. In my previous life, I never really learned any martial arts, but I studied a lot of them to have some mixed knowledge. This will give me an edge in fighting, so I hope I can fully utilize my knowledge in this body. Taking advantage of one of the few breaks that Master Roshi allowed them, Goku hopped onto Kinton to search for a desolated island when night befell. Finding one, Goku positioned himself at the center waiting for the moon to show itself today. I finally get to see Shenron's wish in action. I don't expect to gain control of the Great Ape perfectly today, but some progress would be good. Soon, the moon has shown itself in all its glory shooting waves of lunar light to its participants. Goku looked up from his meditating position, and instantly his eyes swelled red. Goku started accumulating hair across his entire body, and grew meter by meter into the infamous Great Ape transformation. I, I think, it's still hard to control, but least I can control. Goku had a hard time adjusting to his newfound height and extreme fury, that was hidden inside such a monstrous transformation. To counteract this, Goku in his Great Ape form, sat in a meditating position to calm his mind. It is time for the World Martial Arts Tournament. You two can take off your turtle shells now. Goku and Krillin promptly took off their shells and observed their bodies. They soon noticed that their bodies responded to them better than before, and felt like they had limitless stamina. Try to jump your hardest. After Master Roshi's encouragement, the Turtle Hermit apprentices jumped as hard as they can, leaving a puff of smoke in their wake. They easily jumped a few meters and were still rising. They reached their apex looking at each other surprisingly before gravity took control. E this power. It's so invigorating. I feel like I can do anything. This is what it means to surpass human limits. Goku and Krillin suited up and boarded their luggage before setting off to stomp on their competition. After going between various different vehicles, they finally arrived at the World Martial Arts Tournament registration stands. These two will be participating. As Master Roshi was signing them in, Goku was currently observing everyone that has shown up to participate. People of all different shapes and looks were participating hoping to take a spot in the finals, even though some looked like regular people wishing to get lucky. When Goku was looking through at the participants, 
he heard a familiar voice behind him. Ah, Goku, it's you. You didn't even say goodbye the last time I saw you. Turning his head around, he saw a bomber in a crazy new hairstyle, with Capsule Corporation logo clothes. Seeing her new look, Goku could not help but feel that although it was kind of out there, it fit her nonetheless. Well, last time you were quite angry with me, so I thought it would have been better to just leave. Goku had a wry smile on his face at the approaching Bulma. She had a pout as she strutted forward towards him. Krillin's jaw dropped at Bulma's beauty and their implicit conversation. He started to poke Oolong in the ribs to ask him the question that floated in his mind when he saw Bulma. W who is this gorgeous lady? How does she know Goku so familiarly? Her. Huh. That's Bulma. Don't be charmed by her looks, she is a devil in human skin. As far as I know, they aren't in a relationship. But who knows? They went on a crazy adventure together, and had a lot of time to themselves. Before Krillin could respond, Bulma, when she was close to Goku, suddenly squeezed the life out of him once again. Krillin's eyes bulged out at the display before cursing himself. Sitting on top of a floating island in the middle of nowhere, a frizzly Nico was lounging around. What was particularly weird was what the Nico was sitting on. He was sleeping on a beanbag-shaped object made entirely out of green beans. Said Nico wakes up with a yawn and started looking at the overflowing amount of green beans in his home. Oh, Kani, I should really do something about these sends of beans. They are overtaking my home. The Nico was contemplating before ultimately deciding on the most unforgivable sin in this universe. Ah, I should just destroy them. All they do is feed a normal person 10 days and nothing else. Useless otherwise, the Nico proceeded to destroy the overflowing beans. Finally, after Goku's insistent ramblings, Bomber finally released him. You still so short, huh? It's been eight months and you barely have grown a centimeter. Bomber let out a light sigh. You can see some disappointment in her eyes, but the reason was unknown. So how have you been, Bulma? Still, looking for a boyfriend. Goku said remembering the reason for both of the Dragon Ball trips. I tried, but it didn't work out. I've just been hanging out with some girlfriends, like Chichi that we met at Ox King's place. Remember her? Bulma was twirling a stray hair next to her eye while talking to Goku. Chichi. Bewildered, Goku couldn't help but exclaim out loud. This wasn't anywhere close to how it was supposed to go. Yeah, you remember her. Actually, where is she? She came with me Bomber started to pivot in 360 degrees with a hand on her forehead, looking like an explorer. The girl in hiding was actually behind Krillin, peeking her head out towards everyone. Krillin yelped in surprise and scurried away like a frightened kitten. Looking at her young features that rivaled Bomber, Krillin couldn't help but overflow with envy. Chichi had actually gotten a little taller than the last time Goku saw. Her childlike face was less apparent, and her clothes were of a city girl's standard. Or more like the Bomber standard as they were wearing the same type of clothes. When Bomber beckoned her over, Chichi shyly came up face to face with Goku slightly looking down at him. Hey, Goku. Seeing the awkward situation that was about to turn up, Bulma immediately saved her. So Goku, she put her arm around Chichi, you going win this tournament. In it to win it. After chatting with them for a little while longer, Krillin and Goku finally entered the preliminaries. Surround by big Judes and small Judes, tall Judes, and short, Goku felt like he was at an art gallery of every man possible. Hey, we were trained by the legendary Master Roshi, we should go easy on these guys. Yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Before they can proceed further, Goku was confronted with a tall man with a scar on his face. With a newly fresh cut, he looked at Goku with an indignant expression. Hey, you kid, your name is Goku, right? It's me, Dio. Wait, that's not right, it's me, Yamcha. I've been training diligently just for this moment where I beat you up. Well, good luck. I bet you will be a leading figure in martial arts if you keep this up. Confused at Goku's ramblings, Yamcha stormed off after he heard it was his turn to fight. Goku and Krillin made it into the finals, representing the pristine Turtle Hermit School. After beating all the grown men like the children that they were, they ran around the crowd like chickens looking for some of their friends. Hey, guys. Goku finally found Master Roshi, Bulma, Chichi, and Oolong in the crowd as he pulled Krillin along to meet his friends. Phew. Goku isn't closer to any more girls. Wait, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Krillin was couldn't help but ponder as everyone talked about their entry to the world tourney. The martial arts world tournament is finally going to begin. 
To all eight contestants, please step inside the main temple. The announcer's voice was projected into the audience beckoning all finalists to him. Looks like that is you guys, we will cheer for you guys from the crowd. Inside the main temple, a crowd of martial artists are socializing and scouting out their competition. In the corner, there was an old man talking it up to a young purple-haired lady that had a somewhat disgusted look on her face. Next to a pillar was another man who was ignoring his surrounding by meditating with his hands clasped together. Standing menacingly in the back, a dinosaur creature was staring at his competition like they were his prey. When Yamcha saw Krillin and Goku enter, he started to walk towards them only to be intercepted by a large man with nearly no clothing. Yamcha nearly passed out just from smelling him as he passed by everyone. Goku couldn't help but step a few feet back from the smell. This is the worst smell I have ever come across. It's like everything smelly in the world decided to make a mutated baby. Before he can recover, a man with blonde hair filled with gel and sunglasses walked in the door. Contestants, please come and step forward except you. He pointed at Bacterium while stepping back little by little. We will be doing a standard tournament style, and we will decide the order by picking numbers out of this box. When I call your name please step forward. Nam no point six. You are in battle 3, Gyron no point 3 you are in battle 2, Bacterian no point 2, you are in battle 1 Yamchid. I I mean Yamchid no point 7 you are in battle 4, Krillin no point 4 you are in battle 2, Son Goku, when Goku started to walk up, he noticed that everyone's order is changing a little. The butterfly effect is becoming more and more apparent. It will only get worse, and there is nothing I can do except prepare. No point 1 you are in battle 1, Looking at Bacterian's visible smell, Goku shivered and lamented his luck. Ran Fan no point eight you are in battle four. Jackie Chun no point five you are in battle three. After everyone's match has been decided, the announcer told them the rules. The matches will be one round and will be decided if you fall off the stage or give up. Poking of the eyes or vitals will get an automatic ban, so restrain yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen from all over the world, the World Martial Arts Tournament is finally going to commence. We have the matchups decided. It's going to be an exciting tournament with some interesting contestants. For round one, we have Sun Goku vs Bacterian. The winner of the entire tourney will take home 500,000 zini. Before we start, a word from our sponsors. Alright, let's hear it for our two contestants. Wote on the right corner, we have Bacterian. He has never taken a shower in his life, and has probably killed anyone that comes close to him with his smell. We are lucky he is wearing those shorts or everyone in this arena would have probably died. On the left corner, we have Goku. From his attire, he presumably has trained under the fabled turtle hermit, Master Roshi. He is 13 this year, making him one of the youngest finalists ever. Let the first battle of the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament commence. A gong can be heard signaling the start of the battle. Bacterium started the battle with a disgusting gaze as he swiped at Goku. The smell penetrated everything and reaped whoever it touched. Goku quickly backed away from Bacterium like he was a pandemic. He just wished he packed a mask if he knew he was going to fight Bacterium. Bacterium saw Goku back away, so he started to puff his chest. He blew out rancid air directly towards Goku, hoping to stun him. Goku counterattack to him was to also puff up and blow air. With Goku's lungs, he was able to successfully repel Bacterium horrid breathe right back at him. Bacterium was all too used to his smell, so it didn't affect him that much, but the properties of the stench still tickled his nose, making him sneeze. That was all Goku need as he held his breath and approached Bacterium full of fighting intent. He punched him right in the gut, making him double over. To finish it off, he roundhouse kicked him in the face to make him fly off the ring. He landed off the stage with a crack as stars accompanied his vision. Bacterium is off the ring. What a spectacular first fight. On to the next fight. We have Gyron here on our right. A monster from the wild. He decided to come to show how weak humans are. To our left, we have Krillin. Former martial artist of the Oren Temple and current student of the Turtle Hermit School like Goku. He is also 13 like his fellow peer to come to participate in this competition. Let the second battle commence. Hey, I don't like fighting kids. Come here, I got something for you. Confused, Krillin approached the dinosaur expecting something like a kid trick or treating. When he came close, Gyron swiped his tail slapping Krillin a few feet away. Right before he hit the wall of the temple, he flipped over and landed his feet on the wall. I knew a monster like you would trick me. Krillin used his feet and sprang towards the surprised monster. He headbutted him in the chest, making him step back a few steps. Seeing that he is still doing well despite his full blunt headbutt, made the bald monk fear him. You are pretty tough for a kid, but you are going have to do better than that. 
Jiren shot a feral gurn at Krillin and rushed him. He clasped both of his hands and swung it down on the bald monk. Krillin used his heads to defend himself, but he still sunk down on the concrete with his arms shivering. Seeing that he is on the losing end, Krillin slipped out from under him. Seeing the dinosaur approaching him, Krillin was scared out of his wits. Knowing that he was going to lose if he didn't do anything, he put his arms behind him in a clasping motion. Kamehameha saying the familiar words, Krillin was making his last stand. It took all his effort into making the signature turtle hermit technique. Ha! Krillin launched the blue beam at Jiren. Seeing the blue beam approach him, Jiren used his wings to fly up. Once he was up, he dived towards the shocked Krillin that still had his arms outstretched. He punched him right in the jaw, making the young man spiral out of the ring. What a puny human. Ha ha ha. Jiren was laughing boisterously to himself. Goku didn't expect Krillin to lose to Jiren, but he soon forgot out the specifics. When he saw Jiren laughing, he shot a murderous glare at Jiren, promising himself to finish him, while ignoring the flowery words the announcer said. This next fight we have coming up is Jackie Chung coming from our right. He is an unknown fighter and is a rising star. To our left we have Nam, coming for a village far away. He is hoping to win for the sake of his people. Let the third battle commence. I am sorry, respected old man. I need to win for my village. I am not too sure about that. Nam approached the old man with a flurry of kicks that was a blur to any normal person. To his surprise, Jackie Chun was easily dodging all of them. Very nice potential, but you are severely lacking. Jackie, in the midst of dodging, threw a punch too fast for anyone to see. Nam's face caved in, and he flew back to the edge of the ring. Just as he was about to go overboard, he used his toes to barely keep himself steady. Sensing the gap in power, Nam decided to go all out and jump towards Jackie. He sent a karate chop to his neck only to be stopped by a casual counter. Jackie threw him upwards with a lazy expression. Infuriated, Nam used his ultimate move with his elevated height. Strike of the heavens. He crossed his arms in an X-shape barreling towards Jackie. Just as Nam was about to crash into Jackie, Jackie's figure started to blur. Nam finally reached the ground, but instead of hitting Jackie, he went through him into the ground. Nam slowly came up with a dazed expression on his face. Behind him, Jackie materialized out of thin air and hit him hard on his back, sending Nam out of the ring. My afterimage got you, eh? As the announcer was declaring the winner, Nam got up and started to pack his things. Hey, nice fight. I see you are in a rush. Yes, I cannot wait any longer. You can get the water here for free. There is a well over there. Help yourself. Jackie gave Nam a capsule knowing what he wanted. Nam, processing what Jackie told him, finally took his gaze away from the capsule to ask the old man some questions. However, when he looked up, Jackie was nowhere to be seen. In a purple planet out in the far-flung galaxy, there stood a tall man with a very pale complexion. He had a ring around his neck as he sipped on his tea in front of him. On his other hand was a staff with a black orb on top as he looked into it. Seems something has happened a few years ago. I don't know what, but there were multiple tears in space in different spots across the universe. Hum, I don't know what happened, but I will inform Lord Beerus to see if he cares enough to investigate when he wakes up. After looking through it a little more, he put his staff down and started to eat the bagel-looking pastry in front of him. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are on to battle number four. On the right corner, we have the beautiful Lady Ranfan. Her seductress motifs are second to none, as she can even have pigs drool over her. You know he is talking to you, right? Bulma was looking down at Oolong with a look of disdain on her face. Oolong was indeed drooling so much that Bulma and Chichi had to step back a little when a puddle formed. A, at least M Master Roshi isn't here. I am afraid of the venue turning into a lake. Where did that perverted old man run off to? Wait, why are we even hanging out with these perverts? Chichi and Bulma were having similar thoughts, as the announcer was introducing the next contestant. On the left corner, we have the ferocious Yancha. Former desert bandit, his charming looks are put to waste when put to the real test. Yamcha was already in a fighting stance, but he wasn't moving at all like a statue. It looks like his soul was drained when taking one look at Ranfan. Yamcha, you can do it. Hearing a voice to her right, Bulma turned that direction to see Pua animatedly cheering for Yamcha. Hey, you are Yamcha's partner, right? What is with him? Why isn't he moving? Huh, it's you guys. Of course. You guys are here to cheer on Goku. I Yamcha is extremely nervous around beautiful women. I hope he can survive this match. Pua was looking almost as nervous Yamcha. 
Under the intense eyes of Bulma, Pua couldn't help but spill the bandit's worst weakness to a girl no less. Hum, I kinda remember something like that. Bulma this time was staring intently at Yamcha judging him brutally. Going back to the match at hand, the announcer already commenced the battle, as Ran Fan was looking at Yamcha playfully. She struts up to him in a very sexy manner by swaying her hips. Yamcha's eyes were roaming unhinged from her hips to the two round mountains on her chest. Ran Fan rolled her eyes at Yamcha's obvious staring. When she was close, she kicked him as hard as she could pointedly avoiding the sharp sword in front of Yamcha. That might stab her. Yamcha's sword immediately sheathes itself as he skids across the platform, struggling to stand. Before he can reposition himself, Ran Fan dashed up to him and launched a high kick to his face. Using his fast reflexes, his arms lurched in front of his face to form an X shape to block the kick. Yamcha was able to avoid a painful hit and counterattacked by grabbing her raised leg with one hand and punched with his other. Before his fist connected, he saw the bashful look on Ran Fan's face. Oh my, you can see my hidden place down there. I didn't take you for the aggressive type, not that I mind. Yamcha instantly froze while his face looked like a ripe tomato. His pupils were gone and he had gone into a daze. Giggling, Ran Fan leaned in right in his face before punching him square on the jaw, making a tooth fall out. You can see Yancha's goofy face turn into one of horror when his eyes landed on the flying tooth. Ah, shit. My handsome face. You are going to get it now. Enraged, Yamcha shot out his fist without thinking of anything. It landed on Ran Fan's stomach making her heave. Yamcha followed up with a sweep at her feet to make her fall on her butt. Yamcha was about to land a finishing blow on her head to knock her out, before he saw the sultry smile on her face. I, you don't want to hit me right? Chh, how about a date after this? You look pretty handsome and strong. Just let me win pretty boy. At the end of her tirade, she sent a wink towards Yamcha. After seeing the dazed girl, his entire body froze once again. He was getting pulled harder and harder to her seduction until he heard the last sentence she sprout. After she said it, his gaze hardened and he picked her up. W, what are you doing? At least take me out on a date first. W, 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 wait, W, what are you doing? Ran Fan was flailing around on Yamcha's arm trying to escape. Yamcha, however, was too strong for her after the injuries she took and he soon arrived at the end of the stage. Yamcha dropped her off with no remorse, making her land with a thud. Ch hey, if you want to still go on that date, I am open to it. The last thing Ram Fan saw was Yamcha's nervous smirk that ruined his confident persona. She couldn't help but think of how adorable his attempt was. That last fight ended on a weird note, but we have finally entered the semi-finals. Our next fight if the dinosaur Jiren versus the child warrior Goku. From Jiren's last fight, he defeated Goku's classmate from the Turtle School. Will Goku achieve vengeance or will Jiren shut down the once glorious Turtle School? Let battle number 5 commence. You turtle kids don't seem so tough. The last guy barely put up a fight. Goku didn't say anything and only rushed Jiren with lethal intent in his gaze. Noticing the way this brat upheld himself compared to his companion, he instantly spat at him. Knowing what the spit was, Goku easily jumped over. The spit hit the wall with a splat next to the gang. Some of it got in Oolong's mouth as he was fervently remembering Ran Fan's match. What the food dash? Fuck it got in my mouth. The grossed out Oolong started to haul on the spot. Noticing the crisis before it happened, Chichi screamed and kicked Oolong as hard as she can. Oolong flew out of the venue, defying the saying that pigs can't fly before he let out his entire breakfast on the grass outside. When Goku was above Jiren's surprised head, he did an axe kick diagonally on his neck. He aimed towards the weak spot on the neck, where it would do the most damage towards the head and spine. Using a lot of leverage and momentum from his flight, so when the kick landed people can hear bones crack. Jiren, however, was a monster, so he was more resilient towards blunt attacks. He was about to stand up despite his neck injury, when he heard a familiar sound. Kamehameha. Goku charged up a Kamehameha to throw it towards Jiren. Feeling an immense pressure once again, he tried to fly away like before. This time, he felt something wrap around his right wing. Looking at the reason he couldn't fly, he saw a brown tail locked onto his wing preventing him to fly. Ha! Goku finished his Kamehameha and blasted Jiren. Jiren blocked with his arms, but the pressure instantly crushed them and carried the rest of his body towards the temple wall. He burst through the temple wall and arched down, until he landed outside the venue next to a certain pig. Shit, Jiren didn't notice Oolong and couldn't hold it anymore. He vomited his breakfast of assorted meats and some of his own blood on the top of Oolong's head. 
Everyone else was staring at the match in shock at the sudden turn of events. When everyone awoke from their stupor, Krillin rushed over from the spectator stands to Goku. Goku, I knew that you were stronger than me, but I didn't know by this much. Right now, I am not too much stronger. I just used some techniques and tricks to get the jump on him. Goku wryly smiled at the easy victory, as Krillin was still talking to him about the fight. After that short victory in Goku's favor, we have the second round of the semi-finals. The fan favorite Jackie Chun who has surprised everyone with his old age versus the literal lady killer Yancha, who makes girls fall on their asses. Let battle number 6 commence. You have a potential young man. You will 100% be an important character in the future. Jackie Chun was stroking his hair while he said that. Ah! Thanks, old man. Enough talk, let's do this. At that signal, Yancha rushed towards Jackie with his claws outstretched like a canine. When he saw what Jackie did to powerful Nan during his match, Yancha put out all stops. Starting with his opener, a mid-sweeping kick, Jackie responded with a duck at the perfect time. Seeing his opening, Yancha rained down his claws towards the low Jackie Chun. Wolf Fang Fist. Jackie Chun, put in an awkward position, started to twist like he was in several different twister positions. Why won't you get hit? Punch after punch couldn't touch the Jackie, despite the frightening speed that Yamcha displayed. After a little bit, Jackie finally got the hang of Yamcha's rhythm. Instead of awkward twister positions, it looked like he was actually breakdancing. A vein popped out of Yamcha's head, and if you looked closely enough, fumes started to come out of his ears. He finally launched both of his hands to hopefully end this charade. When Yamcha's hands reached its apex, Jackie used shot out one of his legs above them. Leaning with all of his weight, Jackie brought the fists down until they reached the floor and ran him with his other leg. Yamcha wiped his face from the dirt and stared at the old man in surprise. First Goku then this old dude. Is my wolf fang fist not good anymore? Not giving Yamcha too much time to think, Jackie disappeared from where he was standing creating an after-image in his wake. After-image after after-image surrounded Yancha making him feel impending doom from each individual. Yancha finally lunged and sent his fist straight through one of Jackie's after-image, making it fade from existence. Just as he did, something hit him in the back of his head, making it face plant on the concrete. Rising up, you can see another tooth fell out of place of the not-so-handsome-anymore face. Increasingly frustrated, he desperately tried to tackle another after-image, only to go past it. The talented fighter did a flip and landed successfully on the ground. Feeling pleased with the gazes from the crowd, he turned around to face Jackie once more to resume their fight. Unfortunately, his face ran into a wall, instantly making a third tooth fall as he finally fainted. Yamcha was actually outside the ring already and ran into the ring. This is the moment you all have been waiting for. The final two combatants face to face to find out who is the strongest fighter under the heavens. On the right corner, we have one of the newest batch of the legendary Master Roshi's disciples. Living up to his master's name, the 13-year-old child has made it into the finals and has put up astonishing displays of power throughout the tournament. On the left corner, we have the unknown Jackie Chun that has just participated in today's tourney, but has blown all competition out of the water. Who will win? Cast your votes and let the final and seventh battle commence. Knowing who this was, Goku instantly got into a defensive stance. The two stared each other down before nodding at each other like they knew one another. Well, they technically did, but they didn't know that the other party knew that. Saying no more, they both stepped on their feet, making the ground shake before colliding in the middle to see who is the strongest under heaven. Middle of nowhere in space, in the middle of space, a spatial tear appeared out of nowhere, revealing a disheveled looking man in a yellow trench coat. That accursed fat cat. The next time I see him, I swear I will tear him to pieces. As the man said that, strange green blood came out of his mouth, coating his chin. At least I got rid of Goku like I did. Having him as a threat would have foiled my plans, even more than that stupid destruction god. The strange man started to meditate with a blue-green aura in case him, and astonishingly, all his injuries and destruction energy that lingered from them disappeared without a trace. Sensing an approaching presence, he snickered and turned toward his foe. In front of him was a large bloated purple cat once more with his angel attendant. Along with him was a purple-haired young man with a large black trench coat and a sword hanging from his back. Standing a little further back was a pink skin Kai with golden clothes and a white robe with it. You won't escape me this time. I tracked you figured out where you would be with the help of Kronoa, and brought some back up this time. Both figures powered up with all their might, Champa with a fiery purple aura, 
and the other having transformed with red hair and red aura to match. They both launched a pincer attack towards their target as the three figures duked it out, shattering space around them. Jackie started the fight with three swift kicks in a vertical line, aiming to end the match quickly. Tracking the trajectories of each kick, Goku was able to match Jackie's speed, and put both his hands out to block. Expecting an impact, Goku braced himself only to be left confused when he felt nothing. He saw that each kick actually phased through him like they were an illusion. Before he can figure out the situation, Jackie's fist materialized out of nowhere caving Goku's face in. Goku, a little dazed, wipes the blood off his mouth when he backed up a little. What the hell? I have never seen that before. Jackie smirked at Goku sensing his confusion. You have much to learn young one. If you can after image your entire body, then individual attacks are a possibility, right? Enlightened, Goku instantly wanted to try and improve himself even more than what he was thought possible. Initiating this time, Goku tried the after image technique that he saw Jackie do earlier. Creating after images wasn't just moving fast, but creating a sense of yourself at the place that you want. Goku was only able to fully replicate it after watching Jackie do it. One Goku popped out after the other, like a horde of monkeys that had just seen their meal for the day. Each one was in a different fighting pose, like an elaborate dance shifting from one style to another with grace. Amazing Jackie was utterly surprised to see the sheer learning capabilities of his own student as his eyes darted from the after images before him. Doing tick for tack, Jackie also transformed into a blur of after images, albeit not as smooth as Goku. He, however, made up for it with his superior experience whenever they clashed. Goku spun around and launched a Superman punch with unreal agility. Jackie sidestepped unhurriedly having Goku's punch graze him on the rib. Jackie sent a fist to the back of Goku's head, only to find air. Goku turned his head just in time to avoid his hit and promptly did a handstand. Goku lurched his two feet to Jackie's face. Seeing the impending souls, Jackie jumped back feeling the wind that Goku produced. Using the momentum from his kick, Goku was able to get himself back up. Goku is this strong. I was instantly defeated. And he is standing toe to toe with that old fool. I need to step up my game. Yamcha's self-confidence risen when Ranfan actually accepted a date with him, but got shot down again when he saw Goku's monstrous strength. Lad you are pretty good, but let's see if you can stand up to my drunken fist. Heck, Jackie suddenly started to become dizzy and swayed back and forth. Knowing this move from his grandpa, Goku also started to use the drunken fist. The very serious fighting competition turned into a slugfist of two drunken dudes as everyone's sweat dropped at the incredible display. Chow is executing the drunken fist. A kid like him shouldn't be able to use this move unless he actually experienced being drunk. Don't tell me that rascal Gohan hey. How are you able to use drunken fist? Goku started to laugh a little in his mind as he told Jackie. Hey, isn't it only to act like an idiot and go with the flow? I see my master do that all time so it was pretty easy. Jackie's face reddened and decided to punish Goku later for that remark, no matter how true it was. Seeing his drunken fist was getting nowhere, Jackie sobered up and backed up from Goku. Goku did the same they started to go back to using martial techniques. After a while, they split up looked battered and bruised all over from the exchanges that they made. I you are one incredible martial artist. You must have one amazing master. Ha ha ha. I yeah thanks, you too. Goku sweat dropped at Jackie's shameless, hidden praise of himself and really wanted to finish the fight already. Once Jackie stopped laughing, he did some strange movements with his arms, like he was a mine with a wall in front of him. Noticing the move and the fact that he was getting sleepier, Goku squeezed his eyes quickly to regain his mind. Surprised at Goku's quick decisiveness, he started to sing his lullaby, hoping all was not lost. This time, Goku covered his ears to block out most sound. Gritting his teeth, Jackie abandoned his technique and sent a fist towards Goku who was open because he was covering two of his vital senses. Noticing Jackie's presence getting closer, Goku just blindly put his arms to block his face and braced himself. He didn't open his eyes to avoid getting disoriented by a sudden intake of light. Goku got lifted off the air by Jackie's sheer strength, and he landed right next to the edge, trying to regain his sight. You are the most promising martial artist I have ever had the chance witness. Unfortunately, you are still behind me in terms of strength young one. Suddenly, Jackie's body swelled up to resemble a bodybuilder. 
he started to kiss his pecs and gave winks full of hearts towards some of the ladies in the crowd. How did none of the Z fighters figure out that Jackie is Master Roshi after the Kamehameha and this technique? Feeling the waves of pressure coming off of Jackie's new form, Goku decided to try out his last resort. This form is not perfected yet, but it seems like I have no choice. Ignoring Jackie's confusion, Goku looked up towards the moon that was shining brightly in the night. Consequentially, Goku started to grow hair all over his body with various monkey features, replacing his old ones. Everyone's eyes bulged at the rumored great ape roamed Mount Peozu, that loomed over them like a titan of death. Shit, Jackie quickly dodged a fist that came towering over him with his enhanced physique. Goku's flurry of punches started to distort the martial ring to an extreme degree as Jackie was barely dodging his death. Goku, although made considerable progress in controlling his great ape form, was unable to fully exhibit and utilize his giant body and 10x increase in strength properly. Jackie, on the other hand, had better control over his enhanced form, despite the weaker power increase. Jackie started to climb up Goku's arms and attacked him with various punches and kicks like an annoying fly. Goku barely took any damage with these attacks, but the accumulation of each attack and frustration was eventually getting to his head. The scene resembled a certain gorilla versus a series of annoying attacks pelting him from the skies. Seeing Goku get wearier, Jackie went in front of the rampaging beast and started to charge up his laser. Kamehameha knowing that this was it, Goku tunnel visioned on Roshi and opened his mouth to concentrated the enormous Kai that dwelled inside him towards his mouth. It was like looking at a light show when the beams charged up with one side entirely red versus the engulfing blue. Huh. Goku fired when he heard Jackie finish his chant. His beam of death barreled his way through and completely decimated the entire side that Jackie was placed. All that was left behind was a shadowy after image that was still in the Kamehameha pose in his wake. Looking behind him, he saw a blue beam full of turtle power spiraling towards him, spelling out his defeat. Goku woke up with a splitting headache like he just woke up from a hangover. Looking around, he saw pure destruction around him from his fight with Jackie Chan. Goku laid there thinking back to his fight with Roshi, and how he lost if just barely. Seems like I lost to Master Roshi even if he was somehow stronger than canon. It is not too surprising. I basically had the same training as the old Goku. So bridging that gap would have been almost impossible. Even with my newly acquired, controlled Great Ape couldn't defeat Roshi's fine technique during his enhanced state. A shadow loomed over him from behind. He turned around to see the rest of the crew. With the addition of Yancha, Pua, and Ranfan, Bulma, leading the group, spoke up to the dazed Goku who was still lying down. E, that was one amazing fight, Goku. What was with that transformation earlier? I have never seen you do that before. Bulma's eyes filled with curiosity as she remembered Goku's wish, while everyone else was filled with a little fear. That was a transformation I had since I can remember whenever I looked at the full moon. It's hard to control, but as you saw, it gave me a lot of power. I am still working on it. Hum, formidable trump card there Goku. Too bad that the great Jackie Chun was stronger than you. What a great guy. You need to keep on training to get stronger, even if you can't live up to his awesomeness. Alright, let's go get some grub. Master Roshi's boasting bounced off Goku and onto everyone else, as Roshi dashed over to the nearby restaurant like a famished hobo. Everyone was at a table having a good time eating to their heart's content. Yancha was attempting to flirt with Ranfan shaking nervously continuously. Goku and Krillin were sharing their training regime with Bulma and Chichi, while they talked about the recent events that led them to be friends. Lastly, Pua was stopping Master Roshi and Oolong from molesting their innocent plump waitress. Hey Goku, what are you planning to do now? I am going to go and train at Master Roshi's. He actually invited Yamcha to join, but I don't know if he will seeing how he is with Ranfan now. Looking over, Krillin saw Ranfan whispering something into Yamcha's ear, while his entire face went red and nearly passed out. I am going to head over to Bulma's. I promised her I would do something, so now that we are not training I plan to do it. Krillin had a surprised expression, while Chichi was elated hearing the news. Why you are going to come with us to Bulma's house? I practically live there now, ever since my castle burned down. Lucky bastard, has got two hot chicks, while I'm going to be stuck with those two pervs over there. Krillin looked over his should to find two giant red slap marks on both Roshi's and Oolong's face, like burn marks. Goku was currently in a car with Bulma driving and Chichi in the backseat. They were hashing out the details of Goku's job at Capsule Core. My parents don't see the point in having security with how laid back they are. Still, with all these armies popping up one after the other, 
They can't argue with me of hiring some personnel. Right now, I have two other guys hired, and I reserve the head guard duty to you. The other two seem intense and tough, so you might need to prove yourself to them. You are a kid after it's all said and done. Hey, I am a teenager, 13 years old. Could have fooled me. Anyway, as the head of security and my friend, you will be staying in the main building, mostly looking over my family and I. The other two will be taking orders from you and looking over the science department. Goku was soaking in the details of his job until he remembered something. He turned around to look at Chichi who was looking at the passing buildings. BTW Chichi, you said you mostly stay with Bulma, right? Where do you sleep? For the first time on the car ride, Chichi looked at Goku straight in the eyes. I live in the guest room next to Bulma. My dad is trying to regain at least a portion of his money back to get a house. Are you going to go to school, Goku? Bulma looked at Goku with the side of her eyes. Cars were honking continuously at her, yet she pretended to not hear them. You kidding? School is cancer. Agreed. Chichi and Bulma said simultaneously. Just as they pulled up to Capsule Corporation, Bulma pulled a fast one on Goku. Hey Goku, you remember our adventure months back? Goku nodded hesitantly not liking where this was going. Bulma started to rummage through her cupboard looking for something. Eventually, she pulled out a shiny orange ball with one single red star inside. I found a dragon ball. I wasn't looking but just found it accidentally one day. Old times, huh? Goku was looking at the dragon ball with a piece of sweat coming out of his head. Good thing they hired security. They were getting out of the car when they saw two tough-looking people at the entrance, intimidating anyone who gets near. One was the definition of a buff man with ripped muscles in every aspect of his body. The other was slimmer for equally intimidating with his sharp gaze. That made you feel uncomfortable. The tough-looking one and Goku starred at each other when Goku got off the vehicle. Everyone can feel the tension in the air weighing down on them as their stare went on for a minute. Eventually, the tough man spoke stupefying everyone. The name is Bob. Goku was currently talking to Bob and his partner Bob about their duties. Goku assumed that both of their names were the same, but they vehemently opposed the idea. They said that their names are instead opposite of each other. Due to their persistent nagging, he had no choice to accept. Apparently, the Bobs heard that Goku placed second on the World Martial Arts Tournament before they arrived, so they already placed him as their boss, despite the age and height difference. To differentiate between the Bobs, he decided to call them Tough Bob and Tall Bob, in spite of their grievances towards the confusion. After talking to them, Goku went over to find Bulma and Chichi to see what they were doing. On the way, he was able to find Dr. Briefs on the side working on something small. Seeing the opportunity, Goku approached him making his footsteps sound as to not scare the scientist. Hey Dr. Briefs, what are you doing? Dr. Briefs doesn't look at Goku, but continues tinkering with whatever is in his hands. A robot cat, just recalibrating this machine. I can't seem to get it to work properly. Have you ever thought about making a machine out of gravity or something? Dr. Briefs finally stopped what he was doing and looked at Goku for the first time. Gravity, huh? I can see many implications for studying gravity and manipulating it, but nothing really practical for me. Besides, there are nearly no studies on gravity, so I would have nothing to go off of. Is it alright if you create a chamber of sorts that enhances the gravity inside? I think it will help me train my body a lot more effectively. Did you not hear what I just said? Even if you are Bomber's little crush, it will take years to develop any gravity-related device. It's not that I don't have an interest in it, but I have no time because I almost have my robotic cat upgraded. Dr. Brief deadpanned. He then pressed a button from his pocket, and an eerie purr that sounded like something was dying. What if I told you I have something that would help? Goku was wriggling his eyebrows in Dr. Brief's direction. What? You never told me you are an alien. In the Briefs family personal lab, Dr. Briefs was observing Goku's spaceship while Bulma and Chichi were wailing on Goku for his secret. Well, it never came up. I don't have any memories of my home planet either. All my grandpa said was that I came from that pod. Bulma calmed down a little after his explanation. Well, that explains the fact that there are no species like yourself anywhere on Earth. You looked up my species. I guess you are a scientist after all. Goku asked incredulously. Bulma turned her head to hide away the blush that crept up her face. Just curious. Anyways, Goku, why did you bring it here? Shichi asked the question on both hers and Bulma's mind. Why would Goku bring his spaceship to study suddenly without telling them? Well, since the pod is from another planet, 
I was hoping that Bomber's dad can study it, so that he can gain some insight on gravity manipulation. Indeed, Dr. Briefs came over to the little group with barely contained excitement. This spaceship is amazing. Such incredible technology contained in such a small device. With this, not only gravity technology will be a breeze, but space travel as well. Dr. Briefs dragged the now starry-eyed Bomber that finally realized the opportunity to tinker with technology from Goku's homeworld. Chichi and Goku sweat dropped at the sight of drool dripping off Bomber's chin and onto Goku's pod. 2930. Goku right now was doing push-ups with the new gravity chamber that was recently whipped up to test it out. It wasn't a large room, just big enough to house eight people comfortably, as they were still researching the optimal ratio of metal to withstand higher gravity. Wow man, this is only 2x gravity. Yet it feels like my body wants to kill me. It was just a week since Goku arrived at the house, and they were already able to create a prototype of gravity enhancement. The briefs were truly mad geniuses. If their lack of sleep the entire week wasn't the indicator. Hey Goku, you can train in here. But remember that you are still technically a bodyguard. There have been some strange movements from the Red Ribbon Army near our house. So I want you to go check on it. Bomber's voice came over the intercom that blared throughout the entire room. You know, if you make a portable version, then we can knock three birds with one stone. One for my training, one for bodyguarding, and one for enhancing your research. Don't get your hopes up. We just made this 2x chamber. So it is safe to say that a portable one, if even possible, is still a ways away. Don't worry though. We have been studying weighted clothing in conjunction with gravity, and we are prepared guy for you. It isn't as intense as 2x throughout your entire body, but it will do the trick. Goku came out of the chamber incredibly sweaty. Waiting for him were Chichi and Bomber with towels, and said guy on the table. Cheer Goku. Chichi offered the towel which Goku accepted gratefully. After drying himself, he excused himself from the girls to try on his new apparel in the bathroom. The weighted guy doesn't give as much as a full body workout. But it does help with getting better control towards such stress. Hey Goku, remember that we are going shopping today. Ah, do I have to come D didn't you say to check the perimeter? Yes, you do. You are bodyguard so it is your duty to guard me with your body. You can do that after we come back. You need new clothes anyway. Knowing that there was no way out, Goku stepped out of the bathroom to the expectant Chichi and Bulma. Oh, Goku. Check out my newest tech. As Bomber said that, she pressed on a little button on Chichi's watch-like accessory. W wait, Bomber. Before she can talk anymore, Chichi instantly shrunk to the size of an average palm. Before she can plop down onto the ground, Bomber extended her hand to catch her. I am a genius, right? This is my new shrinking technology. Chichi agreed to help me with the testing phase of it. Imagine all you can do with it shrinking to this size. Goku was staring at the frantic Chichi on Bomber's palm in amazement. With Goku experiencing puberty and knowledgeable of his previous world's multitude of fetishes, he blushed when he indeed imagined all you can do with it. Forgetting about those crazy thoughts, he went to find the Bobs to discuss the security while he was gone. After talking to the Bobs about protecting the older briefs, Goku set off to the shopping mall in West City with two teenage girls. Ong, Chichi you would look amazing in this dress. Bulma was looking at Chichi in adoration, while she slowly spun around to show how the clothes fit on her. Goku was staring at the two while they were shopping with drool from his excessive boredom. Besides his feet were bags upon bags full of clothes and makeup that Goku had to lug around. Eat Goku. How do I look? Chichi looked up shyly at Goku with anxiousness in her eyes. However, once she saw Goku's dozing expression, a fire suddenly lit inside of her. She went up to him and thunked him in the head loud enough for the whole mall to hear. Even if you are bored, you are still Bomber's bodyguard, so act like it. Ah, just as Goku became more alert, he sensed something headed their way at extreme speeds. Goku flung his hand to redirect the rocket that was about to hit the store. The mall went into a panic at the sudden violence, as the rocket exploded next to a bench instead. Move out of the way. Official red ribbon business. We won't hesitate to use force. Strolling in the area was an old hillbilly, a wolf standing on two legs, and their leader, a red-haired playboy. Despite his red hair, black trench coat, and blue shirt and pants, his name was Colonel Silver from the Red Ribbon Army, if the red bandanas were an indicator. Hey Colonel, Commander Black had told us the Dragon Ball moved to this section of the mall. Silver wasn't paying attention to the hillbilly that was explaining to him what he already knew. 
but to the destruction that the rocket he ordered land astray from its destined path. Looking towards the source, he saw a small kid giving him a glare that made him shiver down to his spine. Silver approached the kid that was protecting two shocked girls. The kid's gaze told him that he was special and knew about the Dragon Balls. Wonder what led him to that conclusion. Hey, kid, my team and I are looking for an orange ball with red stars in the middle. Have you seen anything like it? We will compensate you sweetly. Goku, without any fanfare, launched a punch towards Silver. Unable to match his speed, let alone see Goku's fist approaching, Silver went flying onto a nearby fountain. Everyone's eyes bulged out of their sockets with what just went down. The hillbilly and wolf started to fire bullets and rockets from their firearms in a desperate panic to make sense of the situation. Catching every bullet and redirecting the rockets towards the ground, Goku was able to make sure no one got hurt. Using the bullets, he threw the bullets towards the henchmen to instantly knock them out. Eat Goku! That was the Red Ribbon Army. It is the largest army right now on Earth. Do you know what you have done? The army obviously knew that we have the Dragon Balls. It wasn't coincidental that they came here. We need to head to your home and check the radar. If they are gathering them, then it is for nothing good. We have to stop them. Seeing his point, Bulma and Shichi agreed, even though they wanted to stay double the number of items they had. Knowing their thoughts, Goku sighed internally out of relief. Phew, any more bags plus this weighted armor could have killed me. Arriving at the capsule corporation, they find that it was smoking a little from the back. They hurriedly ran to the front door to see it smashed open. Lying there in a pool of his own blood with multiple bullet impalements was Tough Bob. Running up to see if he was okay, Goku noticed that he was barely alive due to his toughness. Seeing Goku alive with the two girls, Bob sobered up a little to impart the last message to Goku. They have briefs Bob 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 was coughing blood while he was talking. Before he can finish, the light in his eyes dimmed. And he officially left this world. Bolivianos. Although I only knew you for like a week Bolivianos. Don't worry about him. He was on death row anyway. He apparently convinced my gullible dad to let him accept the job, so he can delay the inevitable. Goku and Chichi looked at Bulma with amazement with her lack of compassion for Bulb. He was literally dying right before them, and she had the gall to insult him. Have some heart. Moving past Bob, they arrived that the laboratory was the smoke was coming from. Inside were signs of a struggle, and various machines had bullets holes in them. Making sure that none of the machines were going to explode, the gang started to look around for any clues. They soon found the dragon radar smashed to tiny little pieces with a hammer next to it. They all knew what had happened once they saw the wreckage and radar. The Red Ribbon Army had the intention of getting the dragon radar, only to have Dr. Brief smash it last second. They then kidnapped him for his knowledge about the radar. I am going to get your parents back, Balma. I will drop you guys off at Roshi's before heading off. I can't let you go, they are my parents. How will you find them anyways? You need my help. Yeah. This is something we need to do together. We can't just sit on the sidelines. Knowing that Bulma will not recreate the dragon radar unless she got what she wanted, Goku allowed them to come. They clambered onto Bulma's plane with Chichi behind the wheel. Bulma grabbed the broken dragon radar and started to rebuild it from scratch. They headed off to Master Roshi's place in the meantime to recollect and plan. Just outside the turtle house, Chichi landed the aircraft on the front lawn, blowing all grass in its wake. Chichi ran up to the door and knocked on it, while Goku and Bulma were bringing the tools and machinery to build a new radar. Master Roshi, it is Chichi, Goku, and Bulma. Please let us inside, we don't have much time. Within a second, Master Roshi flung the door open. With the speed of the door flying open, you can see Master Roshi's boxes flying wildly along with it. Chichi's face got beat red, especially listening to the yoga exercises on the television behind him. He and Missy. Roshi's casual reply was the final straw for Chichi. With no hesitation, Chichi slapped Roshi right through the turtle house, skipping across the water like a rock. Ignoring the flying Roshi, Goku and Bulma went past the murmuring Chichi that was staring at her palm and into the house. They used the table that was situated in the middle of the room and started to do finishing touches on the radar. That radar was more smashed than we thought, took longer than I expected. That was Bulma one hour after arriving at the turtle house. During this time, the others were just doing miscellaneous jobs to help her out. Alright, let's head out. What does the radar say? Everyone crowded around the dragon radar to see the readings once Bulma activated it. 
The radar beat twice before the map was displayed showing one blinking dot at the center. Zooming out more, everyone saw a cluster of dots with another lone dot blinking far away from them. Alright well if the Red Ribbon Army is collecting the Dragon Balls. The cluster is probably them. Oolong easily deduced the obvious after looking at the cluster of four that was in one spot. If that is the case, then this person with one ball will be in danger. Bongla pointed at the other lone dot in the distance with a worried expression. Are we wait, didn't you guys say that there are supposed to be seven Dragon Balls? If you count the four that the Red Ribbon Army has, ours, and the other lone one, then that is six. Chichi asked with a confused expression. Although Goku and Bulma told them about the Dragon Balls, the idea that a magical wish-making dragon will come before them after talking to a bunch of balls made them sound insane, if to say the least. Goku pressed the zoom button on the radar. However, no matter how much they zoomed, they still couldn't find the last one. I guess we will come to that after we deal with the Red Ribbon Army. They are the immediate threat right now. After everyone agreed, Goku was trying to convince everyone that he himself was enough. We are fighting the Red Ribbon Army. The only one that will come out safely would be Master Roshi. Goku was trying his best not to hurt the girl's feelings. Even though what he was saying had a lot of sense, the girls still could not accept that they would get left out on a potential adventure. You guys are making me use my final move. Intense staring ensued between the three as they looked at each other in anticipation. Goku inhaled deeply puffing up his chest. Sweat started beating off both Chichi's and Bomber's face. As they were dying in anticipation, he blew as hard as he could to create a gust of wind whirl inside the cane house. Before they can react, Chichi's skirt and Bomber's shirt started to blow up to their face revealing scandalous material. Hearts started to pop out of Oolong's and Roshi's, as they were slowly dying from blood loss from their nose. They did a dive toward their closest girl hoping to revel in their warmth. Chichi and Bulma were too busy beating the snot out of the two perverts to notice Goku sneaking out with the radar. Once he was outside, Goku punctured a hole on the engine covering him in smoke. Nimbus. He could see the Nimbus cloud racing toward him in the distance when the door slammed open. Bulma and Chichi had a death in their eyes as they raced towards Goku leaking lethal energy. That made the grass and flowers shrink in fear. Before he could be torn apart, Goku leaped toward his savior landing on the cloud before the claws of death could reach him. You better not show your face again, or I will kill you Goku. After a couple of hours, Goku approached a small TP that had some destruction around it. When he was about to land, he could hear some fighting from the distance. Going towards the noise, he can see a tall tan man beating down another individual. This individual was tall and blonde with a perfect complexion with distant anguish across his face. The tanned man was winning with a great advantage until the fight took a weird turn. The tall man stopped moving, allowing the other man to hit him in the face, making him fly through a rock. Knowing that the two people were Bora, Yupa's father, and General Blue, Goku rushed toward them with the intention to help. The blonde man noticed Goku approached them and sneered. Halt you brat! This is official Red Ribbon Army business. Scram unless you want to die. He then turned back to face his opponent to finish his job. Goku leaped toward him and extended his foot to the back of General Blue. Cracks of bones could be heard as Blue could feel his spine have permanent damage from just one attack. He face planted on the dirt sliding for a couple of meters. Struggling to stand up he looked a little hysterical whipping the dirt off his face. You monster. My perfect face. You know how much work I put into this. Before he can rant any longer, Goku landed directly on his head, caving his face even more to end his life. Bora stood up after shaking off the mind control, and thanked Goku for his help. Thank you so much young one, these people keep coming for this shiny ball. It truly leaves me confused at its importance. That's a Dragon Ball. It can grant enormous power for those who can gather all seven of them at the same time. As long as you have the ball, they will stop at nothing to obtain it. No wonder Goku requested the Dragon Ball for safekeeping. Although they haven't met for long, Bora could already tell this young man's character due to Kinton. He gave him the ball and started talking about the tower that was beside them. This tower is Corrin's tower and it stretches towards the heavens. It is said that whoever climbs it and drinks the sacred water will have their strength grow exponentially. My family has been guarding it for generations. As he said that, a little boy peeked out from Bora's leg to observe the strange boy that appeared. I wonder how much stronger I can get from climbing this tower. He knew this tower's true test and how little it would help him compared to others. He still decided to do it anyways for any possible power increase. And thus, he began to climb Corrin's tower. Red Ribbon Army Base, HMPH. 
It turns out that Brief isn't the one that created the radar, as our informative said, but his daughter. Although his research in gravity can prove to be of great use, if we can extract the information out of him, I will get to it. A short stubby man with an eye patch on his right I was talking to someone on his phone. He was facing the wall seemingly admiring a picture of himself staring at the same picture. A narcissistic inception. When a tall black man entered the room, he finished his conversation with the man on the phone and turned around in what he thought was a dramatic fashion to face his subordinate. Commander Black, any reports? We haven't heard from General Blue for a few hours since we sent him to get the other ball. We can only assume that he is terminated or MIA. The tall man stood straight like a rod when talking to his superior despite the height difference. Hum, the other two Dragon Ball owners met up with each other. Hopefully, they will fight for the ball so we can swoop in for the leftovers. However, both of them are somewhat strong. So I have taken your advice and hired Tao Pai Pai. A message came from Commander from his phone as he said that. Tao Pai Pai has come to visit sir, I have sent him towards you with a guide. A female secretary spoke in a monotone fashion. Thanks, sending Captain Yellow as well. I have a job for him as well. The secretary was unable to leave her emotions out of her voice, as she choked on her spit a little at the order. However, she knew better and gave a curt reply. I understand, he will be up right away. Facing each other a yellow tiger was sweating bullets when facing the man before him. Wearing a guy that had the words kill you. Sewn on the back supposed to make him look intimidating. Everything was ruined when people noticed his braid that ended with a bow. No one could mock him because he was the most famous assassin in the world has the highest completion rate. One wouldn't escape with his life if that happened. Remember Captain Yellow. If you are able to beat Tao Pai Pai or survive, I will oversee your desertion and allow you to have all the tiger ladies that you want. As tempting as the offer was, Captain Yellow knew that he wouldn't be escaping alive. This is my opponent. I don't even need to use my hands. I will use my tongue to kill him. Unable to take this humiliation, Yellow rushed him like the ferocious tiger that he was. Tao Pai Pai looked at him in disdain and slightly moved to the left to avoid the rush. He stuck out his tongue and planted it through Captain Yellow's neck. Yellow stayed stiff for a second before falling with no life in his eyes. Tao Pai Pai was looking smug at his achievement before Commander Red burst his bubble. It is nice and all that you can kill people with your tongue but why would you want to? I mean, I can guarantee that Captain Yellow hasn't washed for months. No sooner did Red said that Tao vomited his lunch out regretting his life decisions. This tower is crazy. It has only been a few hours and my muscles are so sore. Even though this weighted clothing will help me train, I can't help but think I would have done the first run without it. Knowing that Tapepai was approaching, Goku made double time and started climbing the tower in earnest while trying to conserve his stamina on the way. Just before night came, Goku was able to see the top. Goku was literally creating rain from his sweat as he looked at the top with a hungry expression. He finally scrambled onto the top and lay down gasping for breath. That was crazy. I feel like my entire body is trying to kill me with pulses of pain. Advancing even more up the tower, he soon came before a standing cat. Hello, young one. Incredibly impressive that you were able to climb with tower despite your small size in a little more than half a day. Corin was truly impressed with the promising child that came before him. This kind of potential is one of the kind that he is lucky to see. Looking at Goku more, Corin could see a strange light in his eyes. That made him question him. He started to use his ability to peer into his heart. But before he can fully process what information he just got, Goku leaped at him as fast as lightning. Cat. Goku then proceeded to tackle and pet the struggling cat. Corin could feel himself lose his dignity slowly, as he started to listen to the animal instincts that told him to purr. Nuju. Corin finally peeled the relentless Goku off his back. He shook his body a few times to get rid of all the spots where Goku smoothed all of his frizzly hair. You little rascal, doing that to me, Corin. What do you take me for? Corin then read Goku's heart once more, and noticed that Goku already knew that he was the esteemed Corin, despite being a cat. I got to hand it to you little one, you already knew I was Corin. How can that be? Realizing who he was talking to, Goku raised his mental guard as best as he can. He was on edge because the being in front of him might be able to discern his true nature. When Corin peered into his heart, all he could see is his thoughts and nature. Everything that was related to Goku's previous life and the future was covered by a green haze. Interesting. I will talk to Kami about this situation. I came here for the sacred water that supposedly increases my strength. 
Goku slightly bowed to Corrin showing some respect to the person who literally grows life or death on trees. I see, you are seeking greater strength for future opponents that might threaten the livelihood of your friends. Although he saw this coming, he could not help but feel as if he is naked in front of this cat. The personal mind is the only safe space that should be available to an individual. It being invaded, although at a surface level, feels extremely uncomfortable and makes one shrink in fear. Don't worry. I do not abuse my power or look at more personal things. They are of no use to me. The water is right there. Take it and drink it. Not worrying about Corrin anymore, his eyes darted toward the exquisite jar on top of the fountain. Climbing up, he was able to reach the jar before the scripted attack occurred. Corrin was studying Goku's face as he was already in an aggressive stance. You don't seem too surprised. If it was that easy, everyone would be able to become strong. Sometimes, a half-truth is the best answer. And it did indeed fool Corrin. Staring at each other like a Mexican standoff, they both sprinted at the same time to the water. Corrin was able to launch a preemptive strike through his staff, making Goku retreat with a flip. Just as Corrin was going to acquire the water, Goku ran up behind him and launched a strike. Corrin was barely able to dodge while making the jar sway intensely, not giving him any time to restabilize himself. Goku continued to chase him making him more and more unbalanced as time went. When Corrin first clashed with Goku, he was able to sense that Goku had an unnatural decrease in speed. With further bouts, he was finally able to notice that he was wearing weighted clothing. Even though he didn't know how much weight he was carrying, just any decent weight makes him even more of a monster. Who is this kid? As Corrin was thinking this, Goku was really feeling the weight now more than ever. He knows that he would have been able to catch Corrin already if he just took off his clothes. But that wouldn't be challenging, would it? There are two ways to beat a mind-reading cat. The first is to punch and kick without thinking, so that he wouldn't be able to see through the next move. The second is to go so fast that even if he knows the next move, he won't be able to stop it. Goku was trying to achieve both requirements. The first was extremely hard because, in a fighting environment, action and reaction play an important role in what you do. Slowly but surely, the incredible pursuit was able to bring the sacred water to the edge of the staff. To ensure that he achieves one of his objectives today, he purposely scratched himself on the fountain. Corrin just thought that he just made a mistake during his chase, as he was putting his entire focus on shaking the ravaging monkey of his tail. After one full hour of Corrin being stressed beyond belief, Goku launched a kick to the base of the staff, making the jar pop out of the staff. Goku and Corrin did a leap too with their arms outstretched like it was a baby falling. Corrin thought he was being sneaky and maneuvered his tail to wrap around Goku's torso. Goku however counted with his tail and wrapped it around Corrin's tail. He then used all his strength that he was being cultivating with his tail and threw Corrin into the fountain. Corrin was barely recovering from his days when he saw that Goku had the jar raised in his hand, like it was a holy relic. He stood up to congratulate the monster that has been spawned on Earth. Good work, you can drink it now. Goku took off the lid and started chugging the water down. He closed his eyes and bared through the metallic taste. That water tasted horrible, of course. The supreme water really was just tap water from the beginning. The adventure up here, and me dodging you with a real test. Yeah, but could you have like gotten filtered water? Smart water at least. I tried so hard for this awful tasting water. You little brat who do you think I am? Kami. Just be grateful that I went down to the mortals and grabbed water for you to drink. Goku walked up to the angry Corrin and poked his cheek. Someone's a grumpy kitty. Corrin could not take it anymore and screech. He proceeded to scratch the hell out of Goku's innocent face. Anyways, that was a great workout. You can stay here for the night. Have this Senzu bean. It will be able to fill you up for 10 days. Corrin threw the poor scratched filled Goku a single green bean. Looking at it up close, Goku really could not tell the difference between this mystical all-powerful bean and a normal one. Popping it in his mouth, Goku felt like something was expanding inside of him, filling his stomach and energy incredibly quickly. Touching his face in the place that he scratched himself, he felt that wounds close up as like nothing had happened. Wow, you didn't tell me these sense of beans were able to heal me up. What do you mean heal you up? Corrin was looking away when Goku ate the bean. So when he turned back, he was surprised, to say the least, that all of his hard work venting his frustration was gone. Ugly what? I've had these for millennia and didn't know that they had this effect. The more you know, these are incredibly valuable then. I ah, yeah, you should go and sleep. As they both got ready for bed, Corrin could not help but feel some regret. I should not have thrown away all those beans years ago. Oh well, 
It's not like anyone I know will be in so many life-threatening situations. That would warrant that many beans. I will just save them from now on. With that thought trying to remove his guilt, Corin dozes off having a nightmare of a giant senzu bean eating him. Waking up early in the morning, Goku immediately said goodbye to Corin to head down to the base before Tao showed up. How are you going to go down? Looking back at the expressionless cat, he then did a backward trust fall to the ground. Well, I won't miss him. Goku felt the wind on his face as he dived headfirst towards the ground enjoying the pressure. Before he hit the ground and splat like a mosquito, he called for Kinton to save his life. Kinton matched his pace and slammed into him to catch him. Goku felt like he sunk into a fluffy marshmallow, negating any pain. Goku came in at the perfect time because one could see a pillar flying in from a distance with a human on top. The pillar almost landed on Bora and Jupa before Goku pushed them out of the way. You've saved me once again. Thank you, Goku. Bora had to thank Goku once more before addressing the strange man's locomotion. Who are you? You nearly killed us with your pillar. I am Tao Pai Pai, the greatness assassin in the world. I am contracted by the Red Ribbon Army to take the Dragon Balls that are in your possession. Preposterous. Goku was right. You will never leave us alone as long as we have the Dragon Balls. I have to take him on Goku. It is my duty to protect the sacred land of Korin. No, you don't borrow. Nothing is worth more than your life, not even your pride. You couldn't defeat the last person. So what makes you think you can beat him? Gurk. Goku had no choice but to be harsh and stern in this regard. Otherwise, he will insist and rush to his death to no avail. Bora's pride took a direct hit because he knew that everything Goku was saying was correct. If you don't back down now, I will force you to. Seeing that Goku was serious, Bora couldn't even be mad as he knew Goku was doing it for his own good. Finally complying, Bora took Yupa and back down to watch the fight from afar. Shem PH, sending a kid to fight me. This is a stain on my reputation. I will finish you off in one second with my Taunch to redeem this humiliation. Tao launched toward Goku to kill him with his Taunch like it was his fetish or something. Disgusted, Goku used his right hand to slap him away. A little dazed and full of confusion formed the young man's strength. Tao still had his Taunch sticking out. Goku jumped up and hammered both of his hands straight down on Tao, making him cleanly slice his Taunch out. Copious amounts of blood spurted out from Tao's Taunch as he crawled into a fetal position while holding his mouth. Everyone around had the shivers in their spines at what kind of pain Tao was feeling at the moment. Eat Goku. I think that was a little too harsh. He basically ate his own Taunch. Yupa was looking at Goku with a hint of disgust. T think about it, he boasted about killing me with his tongue. That tongue probably saw more of people's brains than anything else. In a way, it avenged all those who have been tongued by him. I I see. Yupa really started to question his morals as Bora just fascinated at the whole situation. Seeing that Tao started to shed tears from the pain, Goku decided to put him out of his misery with a Kamehameha. Seeing the Kamehameha coming, he half-heartedly put up a defense against it. Originally, he thought that Goku was weaker than him, and only hit him because he underestimated him. He was too busy grieving his own tongue, because he wouldn't be able to boast to people about killing others with his tongue anymore. Only when he felt the heat of the Kamehameha up close did he realize his mistake. However, it was already too late as the Kamehameha disintegrated Tao before he could do anything. Before he died, however, his entire life flashed before his eyes. All the people he had killed with his tongue and the enjoyment he had from it. Ugh. Well, that was an experience finally. This stupid engine is fixed. So much oil leaked out that we had to get more, and someone is a stupid hermit. Bomber had short shorts and a tank top on her that she picked up from her house when getting supplies for the plane. That's the reason why you asked to borrow the spinning turtle baby Gamera. You know I have a submarine that you could have borrowed oil from. Roshi was currently twirling his statch while goggling Bomber like he was inspecting her. That didn't last long as she hit him over the head, making a huge shiny bump appear on his already shiny head. Bomber's head magically got bigger as she berated Roshi. You could have told us that sooner instead of watching that yoga show you pervert. Well, the plane is working now. Did you forget that it's only Goku that is going for those maniacs? If we don't hurry, no matter how strong he is, he will die. Chichi was having a mental breakdown worrying about Goku. She was pacing back and forth the entire time. She was stressing out because she was useless in the process of fixing the airplane. When Bulma left to go get the oil, Krillin brought Yamcha over in his rowboat so that he could train under Master Roshi. Of course, like the loyal dog, 
Sorry cat that pure was. He also came with Yancha. Chi Chi informed them of the situation, and they instantly agreed to help out. Then instantly left to join Roshi in watching the yoga show, making Chi Chi question why her current life. I know Goku is strong, but this is reckless even for him. Krillin was snacking on leftover popcorn that they made while trying to fit in the cramped airplane. His face was getting smushed by a large sports bag that had a rough texture. He had an annoyed expression on his face as it was drilling into his bald head. Launch, why did you pack so much ammunition? Couldn't you like do less? Less. Launch pointed the submachine gun from over the bag to the bald monk's forehead. We are actually going to war with the largest army in the world, and you want less. You aren't from the criminal world, but they are in even the toughest criminal's nightmare. Even you. As soon as he finished speaking, the gun filled even deeper into his head, making him sweat buckets onto the floor of the plane. I don't fear anyone. Got it, Baldy. Krillin turned pale white and slowly nodded his head as everyone on the plane simultaneously agreed in their head to not mess with launch. Ever. I repeat, a little kid on a flying cloud is shooting lasers at US. We need reinforcement. The caller on the other side suddenly lost connection. The phone was on speaker in the middle of a room surrounded by people in uniform. One person couldn't hold it in anymore and burst out laughing on top of his lungs. Once he did it, all the so-called tension in the room disappeared and everyone started laughing. Man, what is with his joke? Station 7 is getting worse and worse every year. I guess the absurdly of the joke made it funny. I know right. Seriously, a kid flying on a cloud shooting lasers. Who is going to believe that? Tom could make a better joke than that and his soul was already sucked in by his wife. You got to admit though, them disconnecting at the end was pretty good. They would had have to smash the phone in order to disconnect like that. Sucks to be the one to report that to Commander Black. Everyone sighed at the same time getting a good laugh at Station 7's antics. All the guards in the room started to discuss what's a prank to pull next, until someone barged into a room looking frantic. We just spotted a little kid on a cloud coming towards us. Someone from Station 7 survived their annihilation and told us of this threat. Everyone looked at each other confused. Station 7 was really telling the truth. That's impossible. They have fully grown men with years of life ventured. How could a little kid end their life and career like they were worthless ants? Before the main HQ's guards could process the information and get into their defensive positions, the entire base was rocketed by an explosion. Everyone started to scramble around in their positions before another explosion occurred above them. The ceiling started to fall down on them burying them in rubble to be forgotten by everyone. Above the HQ, Goku was just throwing Kai Ball after Kai Ball at the buildings that are in his sights. He was even doing a finger gun like a video game. Totally indifferent to the enemy's lives as he reaped one after another. He learned how to do Kai Balls during the week that he was free in Bulma's house. Waiting for the gravity chamber, he learned in the inner workings of the Kamehameha more, and finally was able to learn how to manipulate Kai independently, without the need of a fixed structure like the Kamehameha. Kai blast after Kai blast, he finally reached the main building. After killing the waves of literally cannon fodder with each punch, he finally made it to a lobby. Entering the elevator, he pressed the button that led him to the top floor. Listening to the elevator music, he started to really think about his life as Goku so far. As 13, only three more years before he turned 16. The age that he died when he was still Chris. And soon after that, he would live longer as Goku than he did as Chris. Moving past his possible existential crisis, he finally arrived at the top floor. He felt sad that he was leaving the relaxing elevator music, but there were more important things to do, like pressing the bottom floor button to hear the relaxing music once more. After going up and down several times, he officially arrived on the top floor before a tall, muscular, black man. He had a vein popping out of his head as he squeezed out the words that were on the tip of his tongue. You sure took your time, didn't you? He looked like he was about to burst. In fact, if he held it any longer, he surely would have an aneurysm. Yeah. You could say that my experience was elevating with every press of the button. That was the final straw as Commander Black lunged at Goku with a killing intent that literally covered the entire world. If he didn't release his rage, he would die from overload. However, all the bravado came to a stop as Goku put his fist through his chest. 
His fist came out the other side coated in a velvet liquid. He pulled back from the sticky situation and started to wipe the blood off his hand with Commander Black's suit. It's not like he was going to use it anymore. He looked up and saw Commander Black's indignant face at the fate of himself and the organization that he basically built. It all ended with one pubescent child. Leaving the man to his peaceful and unregretful life, Goku took out the machine from Commander Black's capsule inside his pocket. He took the rocket from it. And when he got high enough, decimated the rest of the HQ. Strangely enough, he never encountered a certain cyborg slash android making scientist throughout his whole trip. Arriving near the base, the Dragon crew milled out of the plane and started up the plane. Bulma was the first to suggest an idea. I got a plan, ready. We use Oolong as bait you know. Maybe they are in the mood for roasted pig dash objection. After careful planning and coordination, the Council of Idiots officially came to an all-out brawl on how to handle the most powerful army on Earth. Soon enough, Pua spotted a flying cloud in the air, as if clouds already didn't fly. Everyone did the standard procedure they tucked and rolled. In the air, Goku questioned the sanity of the people before him. Hey, guys, it's me. Everyone stopped and looked up. They all felt like they were in a dream when Goku came back alive from the gauntlet. Everyone was pestering him and congratulating him on the achievement that he was done. To shut them up, he poured out the Dragon Balls that he had on his pouch to the floor. Wow, so these are the Dragon Balls. They, uh, look mystical. Yamcha and the rest picked up a Dragon Ball to inspect it. This was their first time seeing such a powerful object. Each Dragon Ball was taken with astute curiosity. As I said earlier, there are only six Dragon Balls. Bulma, yeah. This is strange. The radar doesn't show it on screen. It probably means that the last one is eaten or something. Eaten. So what now? Do we need for nature to take its course? Let nature take its course. Do we even need to summon the dragon? What would everyone wish for? Right now, everyone's life was going well. No problem that an eternal dragon should fix. Well, if it's a problem that you are talking about, I would actually like a big breed dash. All three girls in the party whacked Oolong over the head for the comment. When they saw Roshi also have a perverted face, they also beat him until his face was unrecognizable. So no one has any wishes. I would like to make a wish. It's about more information about my race. Bulma studied Goku a bit before answering him. Fine. I know you are trustworthy. We might as well get the last one since we have the other six. It's just how would we find the last one? Are we well I know someone who can track it for us. Bulma gave Roshi the face that makes him rethink any decision to talk to her at all. H. Her name is Fortunata Lababa. She can divine the object that one seeks. She would be able to find a Dragon Ball no matter where it is. For in telling, will it work? Bulma was looking very skeptical. With her science nature, it was very hard to believe that fortune telling magic actually existed. But a monkey kid that can grow to a 15 feet giant is possible. So what isn't of course it will work she is my sister after all. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.